Are you thinking about making a podcast? Spotify has a platform that lets you make one. And if I can figure it out, you definitely can too. You can create your own content all in one place for free with zero hangups and even earn money as soon as you get started. Spotify lets you record and edit episodes from your phone or computer so you can go mobile just like I enjoy to do. My favorite thing about it is that you can create video episodes if you wish and upload them to wherever podcasts are heard. You can even set up subscriptions or if you're like me, listen to support options for listeners to help you grow. I 10 out of 10 recommend the Spotify for Podcasters app. Or, you know, why don't you just step over to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started on your own podcast. Before we get started today, I want to say thank you for every single like, comment, recommendation, and a very special thank you to my listener support group. If you like what we do here at Off The Deep End Podcast, please consider checking out the listener support tab on our channel's anchor link. Without you, we would not be able to continue the great work we're doing with these conversations, breaking down boundaries, and helping heal each other by sharing our stories, our trials, our tribulations, and how we process them. Let's jump straight into this episode. Three. All right, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Off The Demon Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Eddie. Thank you for joining me and our absolutely phenomenal guest we have today. Just hearing a little bit about the background before we dialed in the day to to get this thing started. I knew that this is going to be a very, very special episode. Um, we all have life experiences, but sharing your experiences helps other people not just go through things, but grow through them as well. So I'm very excited to be joined today by Rebel Williams. Thank you so much. All the way from San Diego, beautiful, beautiful area. I miss it very much. I wish I, I wish it would take me back. I don't know. So <laughs> right. Well, um, I really do appreciate you taking the time to do this. Why don't we start with what it was like? What was it like for you growing up? Let's kind of set the scene of of who you are as an individual. So, what was it like for you growing up? Um, growing up, I grew up like in the like South, you know, of course, Louisiana. Um, growing up was you know it was so easy. I mean, looking back, you know, like you didn't have bills, you didn't have, you know, responsibilities. You know, you, oh, you know, your family took care of it. My family was, you know, at, when, at the beginning of my life, we were all really tight. You know, Thanksgivings every. You know, um, we did Thanksgiving together. We did Christmas together. We did, you know, holidays together. And towards the time I turned about like nine or 10, my family started breaking away. You know, um, I think family was, you know, getting too comfortable with each other. Things were getting too comfortably said with each other. And it kind of like broke away. You know, our family kind of just stopped talking. We stopped hanging out. We stopped doing things. So, I really just grew up with, you know, my older brother, my sister. She's 12 years older than me, so she was already out the house by the time, you know, I was old enough to remember. And my brother was seven years older than me. So growing up, I always grew up, what I like to tell people, like seven years older, because, you know, I wanted to hang out with my brother who was like, you know, you know, 14 and I'm seven. You know, he was into, you know, Pokemon and all it is. I didn't even know what it was, but I wanted to like fit in and be with them. Didn't really like have like kid toys you know he was mm. playstation came out around that time so you know i was all trying to be with them and you know we just didn't talk like i didn't see my grandma for like five or six years didn't see my sister for like eight years didn't see you know anybody it was just me my brother and my mom my stepdad at the time and that was pretty much like growing up as until i was about 13 14 yeah okay <clears throat> So, so what were your your teenage years kind of like? Uh, was was there a drastic change in how? So when you were you were in middle school, he was probably already done with high school, right? So, mm-hmm. what, how, what was it like? Were you hanging out with the big kids twenty four seven? Because I know for me, um, I I've experienced something similar. To what you're talking about with my wife's little brother? He's always hanging out with me and my boys when we go shooting. Right. You know, any community service, veteran outreach, sports. He's always he's always there with me. So I I never heard about it from the other perspective. Um, yeah, growing up, you know, I always wanted to hang out with, you know, my brother, you know, and at the time, you know, I wanted, they were always doing fun stuff and I wanted to do fun stuff. And I guess like in my teenage years, you know, at that time he was already, I think, graduated and I was always trying to hang out with him. I was trying to be cool. You know, they were smoking, drinking, you know, stuff like that. And I wanted, you know, I wanted to do that too, as a, you know, young kid. So like, you know, he would, you know, be like, get you a beer or two, you know, and 
chill and stuff like that. But a lot of things he kind of like sheltered me from too. You know, he is like an older brother. So other things probably going on that I didn't even know about nor see, you know. But mm -hmm. I always tried to like hang out with him and stuff like that. He moved out at an early age too, you know, like he moved out the house, I think at like 17. So he, by the time I was like 13, 14, he was already oh, out the house, mm. you know? What what did that- So what, I pretty much like, they- oh, Excuse me, did that change the dynamic for, for how you live life at the time? Because you're, you're rolling with the big dogs all the time. I know that it, it can kind of make maybe like a gap or- or what was it like for you? Did you did you have time to find out who you were as a person? Um, at the time when he moved out, it was just different. You know, I went from mm -hmm. always having a sibling to being like damn near only child at that point. You know, um, it was he didn't really get along with my stepdad at the time. You know, my mom ended up did get remarried, but so so we didn't see him for holidays so even the little bit of holidays we spent together as a family with you know just my family that I stay with I didn't it was just different you know it was just my mom me and my stepdad and it was drastic it was going from people that I was hanging out seven years older than me to trying to make friends and hang out with people now that's my age you know and it was two different things like I always thought I was like I guess like more mature than them because you know they're Pokemon and I like that seven years ago you know I'm on to bigger and better things now you know I'm trying to hang, still hang out with you know my brother age friends you know so that did kind of take a toll I had to like tone it down and understand that you know at the age of you know 13 I'm not 19 or 20 you know I'm still you know 13 I'm still 14 I'm still 15 you know it's okay to like these things it's okay to you know, like the Jonas Brothers, I guess. You know, it's okay. Yeah, it's not corny. There's some burning up and still fire. Right. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm you not going to knock it. It's okay to watch Disney Channel. We don't have to watch Jersey Shore. You know, like, I had to, like, tone it back down and really just try to make friends my age. So it was, at first, it was kind of drastic. And it was drastic because at that age that you're, you know, 13, 14, you're also trying to figure out who you are in life. Mm. So, um. You're still trying to figure out who you want to be. You know, do I want to follow my brother's footsteps? And I guess that was one thing I didn't like growing up that everybody was like, oh, you're just like your brother. You're just like your brother. And I'm like, no, I'm different. I'm a, different, I'm a whole different person, you yes. know? So at that age, I was still trying to figure out who I was, which I already knew who I was, you know, but I was in denial with myself trying to find the right way to tell my family who I was, you know? Mm. That can be Because that can be at that age, difficult. I was real quiet. Yes. At that age, I was really quiet. I, you know, like I didn't talk unless spoken to, like, was, you know, always in my room because I didn't want nobody to ever just question, you know, I didn't want nobody to ever just know. So at that, I just kind of tried to hide everything. You, you know, I went through like a dark time, which I think every teenager goes through that, go you know, that little dark, gothic, emo, whatever. And then they start like it's something else. So then they like something else and they find out who they are. And, that was pretty much what I was going through. It was like a roller coaster, you know? And it took one friend that I met at 13. Her name was like Rachel. We were like best friends. Um, everybody thought we were together. Clearly not. But, you know, um, it took her to really just open my eyes and to really just help me be who I am and who I wanted to be, you know? And to kind of make it acceptable, you know? Not make it so much of a bad thing. Because growing up in the South, you know, you hear, you know, oh, if you know you're gay or you're bisexual or whatever you're going to hell and you know belt of the world and stuff like that so you know you wanted to just like not even have that even like targeted at you so you're just mm -hmm. like oh no you know i'm just quiet you know <laughs> trying to make that can be really difficult i mean i i grew up i was raised in the church uh for, for a portion of my life and i i'll never be able to understand how anybody who's who calls himself a christian has the the tenacity, the, or the, I should say the audacity to judge another person. You know, the Bible specifically says right. to, to pray for that, pray for, pray for the sinner, right? If you, if you have a perspective that every person that's gay is a sinner or every person that's black is, is a sinner, which, which was definitely, you know, part of, part of the church at some point in this country, especially. So that, that doesn't mean you judge somebody else. You know, God is responsible for, for the judgment of others, not that person. So it's definitely something that is 
you know, has been weighing heavy on my heart for a long time. It didn't make sense to me. I walked into a church one day and, they, and this is probably one of the last three times that I'd ever walked into a church in my life. I was like 16. I was like, you know, maybe I'll, let's try it. Let's try this religion thing one more time. Just for, just for heaven's sake or hell's sake. Cause I'm, cause I'm probably going to hell now. So I don't go back. So I walked in there and they said, you know, there's no reason any, any, I want any, as a pastor, I want any gay sheep in my flock. I'm a shepherd of the Lord or whatever. I'm looking at this guy like you already. So I got up and just walked out. I don't, I don't, I don't show up to, to, to a place of quote unquote love to be taught hate. It's just not a thing. And I know that that's only some, some Christians. And I don't want to, I don't want to put out a generalized, you know, target on Christianity, but that is, if you preach a message of hate, it doesn't spew love to others, and you're not going to attract bees with with uh, with with rocks. You're going to attract bees with honey. You can't you can't have right. that. You can't have that. It doesn't make sense. It's not kosher. Yes, that's very true. Definitely understood that, and I guess that's how I looked at things too. You know, you never wanted to be targeted, but I learned, you know, at you know at, at early age around 13, 14, that people are going to judge you no matter what, you know, if you eat too much, you know, they're going to call you fat and obese. If you, you know, if you like another, you know, the same gender, you know, they're going to call you gay and all this. If, if you make too much money, they're going to say, oh, you're too good for us. If you make not enough money, they're going to say you can't give us enough. No matter what you do in life, I feel like they're always going to judge you. So it's mm -hmm. you just got to take what you pick you're going to take. You know, it's just, you got to take something. So mm -hmm. I was like, you know what, I, I'm going to take something that's going to be comfortable and something that I am, you know, because if that's all you can say about me as a person, then you really ain't got much to say. You know what I mean? That's right. Hell yeah. I'm all for it. I think there's so much beauty that is kind of interlaced and tied in with self-discovery. So when you know who you are, you don't have to you don't have to focus on keeping up with the Joneses or keeping up with the Kardashians. You don't need to focus on what this person is doing because you're focused on yourself. And self-focused mm -hmm. is self-love. Self-discipline is self-love. Saying, I don't care what people think, I'm gonna be who I am. That is where my favorite, our favorite in general as a humanity, our favorite stories are from self-discovery. Creed, um, Hercules, right. you know, whatever. Any of these movies and these stories teach us the importance of self-discovery. I really love those movies so much. I, I like that too and I like that you know it can you know find in being myself you know in my teen teenage years just you know helped me a lot too you know I thought I was gonna lose a lot of friends and I did lose this, uh, a, a few but I gained more than what I lost you know so at the end of the day it was that it paid off in the end. You got that? Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I definitely think it's essential to ha have that understanding of who you are. Um, I, I definitely had a lot of identity issues growing up as well. Not having my father's leadership and guidance to, to tell me, hey, you're, you're my son. This is how you become a man. All these things. I had a stepdad and he did his best. But I definitely felt awkward about, you know, not having that. I was, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of young men in this country have issues with not being raised by their fathers. That's just one example of what can create identity issues. And it's never easy when you're when you have the rest of society going against you. I couldn't imagine going through that. So, man, I wish I wish we lived in, in better times like we do now. Right. So you're so you're growing up. You're going through this this uh le these levels of self discovery. What was that? What was that like for you? Other than just say standing up and saying this is who the hell I am, and I'm and I'm not changing for anybody. I love who I am. I'm going to be me. What else? What else? All did you experience? Um, first I experienced. So I used to play basketball. I played in middle school. Um, I wasn't like one of them you know, huge basketball player. Like, I wasn't a LeBron James, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I was good, you know. It was something I was good at and that I liked doing, you know. And um, I played all during middle school, and I was going to high school, and, you know, I was coming out the same. Well, I mean, I guess I was coming out at the end of middle school, too, seventh, eighth grade-ish, you know, and I had a lot of friends that played basketball, and we would, you know, hang out after school because, you know, my parents would work late, so 
you know, it was just something to do. So I'm not at home bored by myself. Because at that point, my sister's gone, my brother's gone, everybody's gone. It's just me, you know, and my parents, you know. Um, it was just something to do after school, you know. So we play basketball after school. As I was coming out, you know, a lot of people that I play basketball with, you know, they would just, like, start treating you different, you know. And they're like, you're like, oh, hey, you know, we're going to go shoot after, you know, after school. We're going to go play basketball after school. And they're like, oh, no, I can't today. I got this to do. Oh, no, I can't do that. So I was like, fuck it. You know, like, I'm going to stay out of school and just shoot by myself. And, like, you go and they're all, all there. You know what I mean? And it was like, oh, I thought you had this to do or you had that to do, you know. And they're like, oh, well, you can't play with us no more. You know what I mean? And it was so just kind of like, damn, like. Yeah, and it was like, dang, like, and you would hear people have like shitty comments, like, "Oh, you had that motherfucker." They would say like, they would say, "Oh, you had that dude at your house, you know, two weeks ago for a sleepover." Like, what y'all, you know, like people making shitty comments, you know, and it's like that's grown folk business. They need to stay out of that. I think people misjudge like you know LGBT people because I think they think, you know, they, you know, I have like just like everybody has a preference. I have a preference too. Yeah. You know, if I'm, like, really close to you and you're, like, my brother, I'm not going to look at you as somebody I'm trying to, like, mess around with or be with. You're, like, my brother. That's, like, family. That's, like, me sleeping with my own family. No, that's not going to work. So yeah. I think people misjudge that as well because we don't want to sleep with everybody either. Like, you know what I'm saying? We have standards, too. So it was just, like, dang, it was kind of like a slap in the face. So, you know, towards the middle, middle school, I just stopped playing, like, stop doing sports and all, you know? And... You know, that was, like, kind of, like, a hard thing. And I had to, like, do other things. So what I did in middle school was, what did I do? I just went to PE. You know, I did PE um, and just did school and hung out with, you know, my friends after class. Of course, the only people that latched on to me were females. You know, of course, no males, like, latched on to me. But I didn't care either because at the same time, like, I have fun, you know what I mean? Like, they were cool. We all hung out. You know, I didn't think nothing of it. You know, seventh grade, eighth grade, sixth grade, well, kind of just like me finding myself. You know, what do I want to do? What music do I want to listen to? Who do I want to fit in? I was still going to church every Wednesday and Sunday, you know. Um, Sunday, we'd, you know, some Wednesdays we have youth, you know, youth night. Sundays, you know, we'd have church. You know, my family was big in the church. And the youth didn't treat me no different. You know what I mean? They knew who I was. They knew what I was going through. And they, you know, saw the little things on MySpace. You know, back then we had MySpace. We have all this Facebook and stuff. But, you know, um, they knew I was, you know, going through stuff. But they never judged me, you know. And that's what I liked about that church, that the youth didn't judge me. I'm sure some of the older parents probably did or whatever. Didn't care. Like, you know, but the youth, the people my age didn't really care, you know. Mm. So I like that aspect. You know, I was just doing community service, hanging out with my friends, um, my new friends that, you know, went from males to females. But, I mean, we had fun, you know, and we, they definitely helped me a lot and helped me realize that, you know, it's okay to be who you are and it's okay, like, people are going to accept you no matter what. And that was pretty much, you know, like, middle school. At the same time, you know, that's when I'm, you know, ended up meeting, you know, um, my you know, for, like my first ex and everything was also during that time too, you know, and mm. um, I was happy, you know, I wasn't what I used to be, you know, and I think that kind of like made it sad in a, in a way because I wasn't hanging out with guys no more, you know, it was all females and, you know, I wanted to just be able to hang out with the guys, you know, or just to yeah. be able to like shoot basketball, you know, and you know, not people think different if I, you know, get the ball, like not think that, you know, I'm trying to like rub up on them or, you know, like anything. Cause you know, people would say crazy stuff when you would play sports. So like, even at PE, we played football, you know, and they'd be like, you know, I would fall, you know, end up tripping or falling on someone. And they'd be like, Oh, he's trying to get you. He's trying, I'm not trying to get you. Like I fell. Like, that's, <laughs> you know, that's, like, and that's, that's just absolutely pathetic. I mean, there's, a lot, a lot of time I hear the word homophobia and, and I, I'm trying to find a good example. I think that's one good example of what homophobic, what a homophobic motherfucker looks like. And it's, it's just disgusting to me. 
okay. because that's the exact same way that I've been treated for my skin color. And I can, I think I can find some common ground and understand that, you know, like it's no secret. I'm not gay, but I've like me, me hearing this, you go through this. It hurts me because it reminds me of times where I've been treated differently because of my skin color. I am who I am. And this, I should never feel ashamed and no one should ever make me feel ashamed of who the hell I am. I'm very, very proud of, of what I look like. I mean, some days, some days I wake up looking a little rough. I wake up at 445 for work and I'm going to be honest, some days, you know, I wish I'm, I wish I would put on fucking makeup or something. But for the most part, I'm very proud of who I am. And I don't want to be treated or made to feel ashamed of who I am by somebody who's definitely not comfortable with who yeah. they are. If, you're, if I'm comfortable with who I am, I don't care who's, who else somebody sleeps with. That's their business. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, but yeah, that's that's another thing, you know. Or, you know, we play football, a game where you tackle people and you would tackle them and they'd be like, yo, get off me, get off me. He's trying to rape me. And you're like, motherfucker, I'm tackling you. Like, this is the game. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to sit here and do, like, nothing else. Like, we're, on, we're in a field. You know, you're dirty. I'm dirty. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's outside. Like, no. You know what I mean? And that's when I was just like, you know, I'm just, you know, I was done with sports. I was done with PE, you know. Um, I told myself when I go through high school, I wasn't going to go back to PE, you know. Um, I was just done with it. You know, I was tired of, like, people saying stuff or, you know, people making jokes or, you know, certain stuff like that. You know, people always say side stuff, you know, during school and I was very hostile at that point too you know I was like well you know we can meet after school you know yeah because at that point like I'm just so angry you know what I mean and yes. you know nobody ever, nobody ever did that so you know I was just like whatever so but at the same time I was hanging out with, you know my friends and I was also you know starting a relationship you know and it was something new to me you know I've never been in a relationship you know, with, you know, a guy, of course, in middle school, you know, I had fake little relationship with females because, you know, I just wanted to be so, so accepted, you know, and I tried, I tried, you know, so many times and I just couldn't, you know what I mean? I just couldn't find myself, you know, I loved them as a friend and as a person, but I could never love them as somebody that I would want to be with, you know, Mm -hmm. and that was something that, you know, it was really hard too because I wanted to be normal. You know, I prayed about it. I, you know, the days that, you know, I go to the altar at church, you know, on Sunday when they would say, you know, if you have anything, you know, you're, you're welcome to the altar. You don't bow down. I would say, you know, God, please take this away from me. Like, I want to be normal. I want to be like everybody else. And, you know, I don't ever want to be judged and stuff like that. And it just never happened. And I just came to the conclusion that maybe this is who I'm supposed to be. You know, I tried everything. You know, I tried everything but exorcism. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like everything but you know, having, you know, having them little scary movies, you know, exorcist, you know, or anything like that. So I was like, you know, maybe this is who I'm supposed to be. And I mean, there were days, you know, growing up, you know, I wanted to accept it. I didn't accept it. I accepted it. I didn't accept it. You know, there were days that I would sit there and just be like, why, 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 why can't I be normal? Is, you know, is it is it mental? Is it a mental thing? Do I need to go seek help? You know, there were days that I would you know, pray and pray and pray. And it just seemed like it just got worse and worse and worse. And I was just like, you know, eventually I I would just accept it. And it was, thank God I made the friends that I met at the same time. And that's something that I highly believe in. I think people come into your life at a, at the perfect time that you need them to come into your life. You know, um, you know, you ask for help and I don't, you know, you always think like, if I ask, you know, for people that are, you know, religious like I am, you always think that, you know, if I ask for help, you know, God's going to shine his light down and, you know, talk to you like he did in the Bible to other people. And it just doesn't work like that. It, you know, he brings, I think he brings people into your life that can do the talking for him, you know. And I think people come into your life for different reasons, rather it's to teach you a lesson, teach you about something about yourself or, you know, help you accept certain things that you're not, you know, ready to accept. And I think they came into my life definitely at the perfect time. And that was something that like really helped me is them letting me know that it's okay to be you, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I didn't think I was going to start crying during this podcast, but here we go. I'm going to be honest, man. Oh my goodness. Um, that, That absolutely breaks my heart that you 
you prayed to be to be different than who you are. That that breaks my heart that people made you feel like you didn't you couldn't be yourself. And I I definitely have some uh, some common ground with that. So um, I wish I wish you were I wish you were treated differently. But I know that these experiences happen to us and happen around us uh, to either to either make us make our break or break the situation. We we can either right. uh, collapse under the pressure or we can become diamonds. And, and literally, because pressure does make diamonds. Um, I'm I'm glad that you you're still here with us today, and I'm definitely glad that you're you're comfortable with who you are. It's never easy to 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 find self discovery is a long journey for some people, and it's I'm still finding out who I am every day. So, oh my goodness, mm-hmm. oh my goodness. Well, I know that you wrapped up. You know, wrap. You know, you do, you're done with sports at this point. You're you have lost the passion to do something that is a great, it's an absolute important, I would call it a key factor in society, doing athletic things because of the feelings it gives you when you're playing basketball, when you're able to achieve something tangible, like like scoring a point or uh, the camaraderie part of being around your friends, your your boys or whatever, right? Hooping it up. There's nothing better right. than than that feeling you get when you're around people with common ground, with common goals. Um, what, what was like the, the end of that, the end of that transition, like for you? So you're, you're wrapped up with your demo sports. Like where, where did it lead up to you wanting to join the military? And what was the last couple of years of high school? Like, um, with this point, I think it was like eighth, ninth grade, you know, I was still, you know, in a relationship, but I mean, you could call it a relationship, you know, I call it a relationship because I feel like any relationship is, you know, you're learning that person, you know, and I was, you know, in a relationship, but it was one of them things where, you know, we met each other at the movies, you know, I mean, this we're in eighth grade, you know what I mean? There's only so much we can do. So, you know, we met each other at the movies or we met each other, you know, at this place in the called the boardwalk, it's in Shreveport, or, you know, we met each other you know, at the skating rink and stuff like that. And we, you know, did all the fun things. And at the beginning, it was like, it was just us being friends. And he actually played football. You know, he was actually on the team as well. And, you know, now we're going to, you know, ninth grade. Well, he was already in ninth grade. I was in eighth grade at the time. But now I'm going into ninth grade. And unfortunately, we didn't get to go to the same school because... The middle school was the same, but the high schools, depending on where you live, were different. Mm. So, um, at that point, I went to a high school, and you know, they had like this block schedule where it was like four periods and stuff like that. And ROTC was one of uh, was something that I picked instead of sports, which was ROTC because you know I was like you know you could pick you had to do something for physical readiness so it was either ROTC or or, or it was um PE and I was like you know I'm done PE you know I'd rather do ROTC nobody told me I'd have to wear these fucking uniforms every other day but you know in ROTC it was like every Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday you had to wear a special uniform and it was actually Army ROTC and I moved up really quickly in the army ROTC because I thought it was so cool. You know, I, I told myself I was never going to join the, the army, but you know, the army or the military in general, but this was what was going to be the closest thing to it. So let's just see how far I can get, you know? And I was really good at retaining information when it came to that. And of course me and the relation, you know, me and my ex relationship, we were still, you know, keeping in contact, you know, every weekend, still hanging out, stuff like that. As high school went around, I was getting more comfortable with myself. And I remember I went to this high school and, you know, it was ninth grade. And it was like my first day, you know, and it was uniforms. We all had to wear uniforms. I think every high school at the, out there had to wear uniforms. So um, at this particular high school, everybody had to wear uniforms. So I just remember I was wearing, you know, J's, my khakis, you know, like my little green shirt because, you know, the colors were like green and orange or some shit. So we had to wear like green shirts. So I was like, you know, um, um, I remember I was new and I was like so lost around the school. <laughs> and this dude hit me up and he was like, hey, do you need help? And, you know, I was like, you know, I'm gonna go to high school and just act like, cause I mean, everybody's changed. It was three different high schools in the area. So everybody changed from middle school to different high school. So I ended up going to this one. 
um, this dude, you know, he was like, do you need help? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, you know, I, I'll, you know, I'll show you around, you know, if you ever need help, you can come to me. You know, at that point, you know, I was making my voice deeper, you know, I was, you know, talking like, yeah, I need help. What's up? You know, like, you know, making your voice, you know, different, trying to like, you know, I didn't want people, you know, I was like, you know, maybe if I go back to who I was, people won't treat me different, you know, so people, um, he was like, hit me up. Well, it, it would, I would never forget that we had like this court, <laughs> courtyard in this school. It was like, um, it was like lunchtime and it was like this gay dude, right? And he was, of course, openly gay and he, you know, wore like, a, you know, like, I mean, he was like really flamboyant, you know, at the time. And, you know, I'm still trying to like hide, you know, who I, I mean, he's wearing like nails and like all the type, you know, makeup and all this, you know. And he was like, yeah, uh, he was like, that's, that's a dude named Moran you know, you got to stay away from him. And I was like, oh, why? And he was like, oh, because, you know, he's gay. Like, you know, and I was like, oh, you know, I wanted to ask, like, you know, do you have a problem with gay people? You know what I mean? Like, you know, trying to, like, see, like, where his mind is at. He was like, yeah, I don't like faggots. And I was like, ooh. You know, like, little does he know. You know, I was like, he's talking to him right now. So at that time, it was, like, two weeks into, like, you know, ninth grade and I was just like you know I went home and I really just thought about it and I saw you know Ren I saw his confidence you know everybody's talking about him of course like when you I mean it was like a movie like when he walked in everybody was just staring at him but he had a group of people that supported him like four or five people that would walk with him you know like you know one of the popular kids his parents had a lot of money you know how that should go so I was like you know what if he can do it anybody can do it you know and I think you know, still to this day, you know, I tell him, like, in high school, you helped me so much, you know, and it's so funny, because when I came out, me and him started beefing. I mean, we don't beef no more, but me and him didn't like each other, you know what I mean? Like, I always thought highly of him, and he just thought I was there to steal the throne, and I was like, no, like, you're the reason. You're not the only you person me. that is, does, he's not the only person that's, you know, gay in, in the world, right? Right, in the world. <laughs> Uh, we joke about it, you know, to this day, you know, but, you know, when we talk and, you know, when I go back home, but, you know, and he was also mixed, you know, he was a mixed kid. So he was also dealing with that, you know, in the South and he, but he didn't care, you know, and that's what I liked about him. And about like, I went home every day for like two weeks, you know, new in the ninth grade. And this dude was still always like coming to me every day, like, you know, let's walk to class together, let's eat together, let's do this. And I'm like, little does he know, like, I'm thinking about coming out as well, just fully, you know, gay, because, you know, in middle school, you know, I told everybody, you know, I was bisexual, you know, and I told, I ended up telling my mom that, <laughs> you know, my mom looked at me and she was like, you ain't fucking bisexual. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, my mom fucking knew. Um, so I came out as fully gay and you know, the dude ended up stopped talking to me, you know, and it was cool. It was like, you know, whatever. But at that point, I didn't know if I did it too early because I didn't really have friends, you know, like at that point, even the friends that I did have, the one, two, these threesies were, you know, didn't like me no more. So I had to end up making new friends, you know, and all the friends I had in middle school ended up moving except like one or two. But the one or two that came to the same school I came to, I didn't fuck with them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I ended up making new friends. And when I came out, I had so much support. And it was it was a lot more. It was a lot of help. You know, I will say the friends that I did have, you know, definitely helped me in, in high school. Um, and ended up getting kicked out of that high school. Um, probably like six months later, um, ended up getting in a fight with this other dude. But and then I had to change high schools, you know. So I ended up getting kicked out of that one and I had to go to a different one, which was this preppy high school. I never forget it. It was airline airline high school. Um, ended up having to go there and it was, you know, like a preppy high school and I didn't like it. But <laughs> you know. Um, end up going there and but people were more supportive there, you know, like I guess it was more supportive. You know, I went from a high school in the hood where, you know, everybody's like fighting every day and doing this and doing that to, you know, a 
a more preppier high school where I had a lot more support and I had a lot more friends from my, you know, previous middle school to support me as well. So there I ended up saying, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm going to do it. It's going to make me happy, you know, and I, I didn't want to do RTC no more. You know, I remember I was getting out of RTC and at my last high school, I was a platoon leader, which is like really, like really good for your first year. You know, I was a platoon leader. You know, I knew all the information. You know, I always went to gunnery sergeant and was like, I want to know more. I want to learn more. Teach me everything. Like, teach me this, teach me that. You know, when I was a platoon leader, I remember I was getting out of um, uh, JRTC or whatever. And he was like, you know, you could do so well. You could go in as an E3. And I was like, yeah, all that shit you're talking about, I'm not going to do. I was like, I'm not going to join the motherfucking middle of the same. So I was like, I was just doing this for fun. I want to go back to PE. You know what I mean? And <laughs> I just thought it was so funny because looking back, like, here I am. But, you know, at the time, I was just like, I'm not doing none of that. All that military shit you're talking about, I'm never doing that. So mm -hmm. I was just like, <laughs> you know, and I was <laughs> so I just remember telling him that. And it's so funny now because I'm sure he's probably laughing if he ever sees it. <laughs> I'm in the military now. But um, I ended up getting out of you know, JRTC and uh, went back to PE because I wanted to play. I want to play dodgeball. I wanted to play basketball. I wanted to go back to sports. I wanted to do things, but I wanted to show people kind of like Ren. I guess he showed me that you can be who you want to be no matter what. And I kind of wanted to show people that you can achieve anything no, no matter like your sexual preference, the color of your skin, where your background is. You can achieve anything you want to achieve you know, even when all odds are against you and everybody is sitting there, you know, wanting, rooting you down, rooting you, you know, rooting for your, you know, unsuccessfulness, you can still be successful no matter what you do. And that's oh, yeah. something I want to do now. So I joined PE, you know, I, I play, you know, I went back to playing sports, you know, at the same time I'm dating, you know, my ex and he's, you know, at this point, the quarterback for his football team at his high school. So I'm like, well, fuck, if people knew he was fucking, you know, like gay at the end of the day, they would disaccept him. I mean, he still, held, you know, hit it. But, you know, if he can do it, I can do it. You know what I mean? So I started, you know, doing PE and stuff like that and, um, you know, finish out the ninth grade year. I was so excited. I was like, you know, now I'm be a sophomore, you know, couldn't wait to be a sophomore. Um, ended up not getting in too much trouble, whatever. But, you know, then it was summertime. You know, summertime is when you do parties. Everybody goes out, out on vacation, stuff like that. You know, ended up getting a job at McDonald's. My mama was telling me, you know, she was like, don't think just because you, I think I was 16 at the time, maybe 15. 14, 15, I, for, I forgot how old I was, but she was like, uh, you think you're going to sit at home, you know, for free? No, you're getting a job. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I ended up working at, like, McDonald's, I think, and that was pretty much, you know, the end of ninth grade year. Mm -hmm. Well, damn. I'm 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 very happy that you, you ended up revisiting PE because you deserve to do whatever you want to do, and, and yeah, you know, shove your, your, confident, your confidence and the, the comfortability with yourself right in the people's face who aren't comfortable with themselves um it's something that i really really do 100 percent support uh -huh. um i think next was sophomore year you know sophomore year was just so quick i feel like i was there like three or four months and at the time you know I was getting into, you know, kind. Of, I was trying to be popular, you know. I wanted to show people that you could be popular, you could do anything. And I wanted a lot of friends, you know, just like, you know, everybody else in high school wants friends. They want to be accepted. That's all high school is about is just finding acceptedness through different people, you know. No matter if you're, you know, the geek, the chess club, you know, whatever club, that's the people you hang around. That's the people you're always going to remember, you know, in high school. And I was one of the people I was... I was a floater, you know, I could talk to the nerds, you know, because at the end of the day, I was low-key a nerd, you know, was I labeled one? No, you know, I didn't want a label, you know, but I could talk to them about, you know, World of Warcraft, I played that shit, you know what I mean, yeah. didn't nobody know, you know, I, I, I like Harry Potter, you know, I could talk to them. Oh, I fuck know, with I Harry Potter, oh yeah, heavy, heavy, right. heavy. 
I can talk to the jocks because I know about playing sports. You know what I mean? I can talk to them. You know, and at that point, it was getting to where more people was accepting me too. And, you know, I could talk to the jocks, you know, because I know, you know, about sports. Don't ask me about baseball or any of that. But, you know, when it came down to like, you know, basketball or anything like that, you know, I I played that in middle school. You know, I could talk to, you know, the popular kids. I knew all about, you know, fashion and stuff like that. You know, I mean, of course, like all gay people, we all know about fashion and shit. So, you know what I mean? Like, I just... I could talk to, you know, different people, you know, and I was kind of like a floater. And then um, it was so crazy because I ended up getting into another fight, which was with another gay dude. Never forget it. And I don't even know what we were fighting about, but we ended up getting like fighting and I ended up getting kicked out again. Um, So when I got kicked out, you know, the options were homeschooling or a different school, or it was getting my GED. And at the time, you know, I think Will, I think Will was about to be a um, senior. And I was like, you know, I like it. Like, you know what I mean? So I ended up getting my GED and going to GED class. And at the time, me and my stepdad, we wasn't getting along. My mom was trying to shelter me. So my mom worked in a morgue at that point at LSU. And she was all the time saying, like, you know, what she tells me now is not how she explained it when I was younger. But, you know, she tells me that, you know, she was seeing a lot of LGBT people getting beat up, beat up dying, them killing their stuff and stuff like that. And she didn't want that to happen to me. And she was really sheltering. You know, it went from I could be back in the house at 11 p.m. to, you know, I had to be home by 8 and it went, you know, like, how did it change from, you know, like, this drastically, you know, like, I have to be back home by 8 from when I used to hang out with the jocks and stuff like that at 11. You know, I was like, that's unfair, you know, and she was trying to shelter me. She, you know, took my cell phone away. I didn't have a cell phone, you know. We didn't have computers. She didn't, like, computers. Um, we didn't have nothing. So it was literally just, like, school, hang out with my friends in the neighborhood and home. Like, that was it. And... I finally, like, met some new friends and, you know, their parents didn't give them roles, you know, like, and that's what I wanted to be at. Like, I was, like, 15, I think, 15, 16, and I didn't want roles, you know what I mean? And I think I was being, like, really rebellious at that time, too, coming in late on purpose, you know, like, you know, smoking cigarettes, like, I didn't care, like, you know what I mean? And I got into it with my stepdad one day, my old stepdad, my ex-stepdad. And he was like, well, if you don't like the rules, you can move out. And I was like, and I sure will. You know what I mean? Like, because at this point, I don't want no rules. And I don't think it's fair to y'all, like, trying to shelter me. Like, I was like, I haven't been to shelter since I was, you know, eight years old. You know what I mean? And I'm like a teenager at this point. Like, you didn't shelter my brother like this. You didn't shelter my sister like this. Like, they got to do whatever the fuck they wanted. You know, why am I sheltered like this? You know, my stepdad wouldn't let me wear pink. At that time, in 2010, 2011, is when them polo pink shirts were coming out, and it was, like, like for breast cancer, and it was all about, you know, real man wear pink, real man wear mm -hmm. wear pink. It was, like, a whole, like, big thing they had. And I, yeah, it was a movement. And I ended up getting me a polo pink shirt, which was a light pink. It wasn't even, like, no hot pink. It wasn't no, like, pink pink. It was, like, a light baby pink. You know, and I wore it, and my stepdad threw the biggest fit about it because I wore that, and I had, like, pink shoelaces on my Jordans. Like, so mad about it, right? And it made me change. Before I left the house, like, treated me like a whole female. Like, like I'm wearing, like, booty shorts or something. Like, I was wearing, you know, blue jeans and a fucking light pink polo shirt and a light pink polo shirt hat. And, you know, my shoes were Air Forces with motherfucking, you know what I mean? light pink fucking shoelaces like it wasn't no fucking like I wasn't you know and I was wearing it you know to go out with my friends and I had the whole change because you know I just thought that was so unfair so you know I it had, was yeah you know at that you point he was, also, he was also, yeah and he was discriminating against me and I felt some type of way and he was telling me if I didn't like the rules I can move out so what I did I packed my bags um and I ended up moving in with my homegirl and her aunt. And 
which was only probably like a 10 minute walk from where I was originally staying, but still it was out the house, you know, and I remember I was, you know, telling myself, I was like, I'm never going to talk to my parents again. I'm never going to talk to my parents. Like, fuck them. You know, I'm smoking heavy, you know, <laughs> smoking cigarettes back to back to back because you're so stressed out and so pissed off, you know, and I was always waiting for that phone call and I just never got it, you know, and at the point I was, um, getting my GED. So I was still going to GED classes. You know, I had think I had to wait to the end of the month to get my GED and, you know, ended up getting my GED. And my mom calls me maybe like two or three months later and tells me that, that her and my stepdad are moving to Georgia, which is like, what, three or four states over from Louisiana, what, Mississippi, Alabama. Yeah. So like three states over. And that they're leaving next week and I have to get emancipated. So I was like, well, fuck. I couldn't imagine being being told that I need to emancipate myself for my parents while they're moving uh, out of state. Wow, that that is uh, that's tough. Or your mother and your stepdad, forgive me. Mm -hmm. they looked at it as, you know, they didn't know what I was doing. They couldn't control me. They thought I was going to, you know, move back in, you know, like two or three days later. And at, the, at that point, I had so much fire, I guess, like in my heart that I was like, you know, I'm showing y'all, you know what I mean? And that's how I looked at everything. Like, I want to show y'all that I don't need y'all that I can do this by myself, you know, I don't need support, you know, and that's how I kind of did um, once, you know, I got emancipated, I got my license, you know, luckily I already had like a vehicle that they signed over me, but, you know, they were listening to, you know, word of mouth, you know, and they wasn't listening to me, you know, they were listening to people in the church and people in the town telling them like, oh, he's doing this or oh, he's doing that or oh, he's, you know, and at that point in time, I wasn't doing none of that, you know, and, you know, people were saying, oh, you know, he relapsed and he's doing this, he's doing that. And I wasn't even doing drugs at that point. You know, I didn't want to do drugs. I didn't, I wasn't drinking. I wasn't doing nothing at that age. You know, I was just trying to live my life. You know, I was still trying to figure out who I'm with. And at that point, I was in a relationship. And I was happy that they were emancipating me, honestly, because it means I have no more ties to them. You know, I told myself, you know, when I moved out, that I never want nothing to do with them ever again. So them emancipating me was honestly like a blessing, you know, at the time, what I thought. And, I, you know, at that time, I already got my GED. So, because I got my GED, like, not even two or three months later after I dropped out. So, I was like, you know, I can go work 40 hours, you know. And I was living, I will never forget, I was living with this <laughs> lady named um, Stacy. She's probably listening. She's on my Facebook. And, um, or she probably will listen. Um, Stacy and my homegirl, Joyce, which was, you know, of course, older than me. I think I was 16 at the time, and Joyce was, like, 20. But I was so used to talking to older, you know, older people anyway. Not that she was old, old, but, you know, she was older than me. And I looked up to her. I really looked up to her. She was from California. They were from Victorville. They moved to, you know, I met them in the apartment complex. as like my friend's mom, you know, and I would always see them at the pool and stuff like that. And, you know, conversation goes a long way. That's what I always tell people. And, you know, I was telling them how I wanted to move in somewhere that was reliable because my friend, her aunt was on meth, you know, and um her aunt was doing meth and I just remember you know I'd wake up and her aunt then redecorated the whole house and then you would wake up and her aunt would be knocked out for four or five days oh my you know goodness. or I'm she so would sorry be sorry for her um she ended up getting off meth you know she's still alive um but I just remember nothing would be the same in the house you could leave you know your soda down for five minutes and you know and Five minutes later, it's somewhere else. You know, somebody else is drinking out of it. Like, nobody had no rules there, you know? And it was, like, no rules at all. And I didn't want that lifestyle no more because I was just yeah. like, dang. Like, this is, this stability. Is... And at the time, it's like, this is way too much freedom. You know, I, I wanted mm. freedom, but this was, like, 
I mean, I could be out for five weeks and nobody would ever ask where I was at. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was a little bit too much freedom because you still want that that somebody's worried about you type of freedom. You know what I mean? Like if you go missing for a couple of days or you haven't post, you want somebody to look for you. You know what I mean? Or you want somebody to acknowledge that you're gone, you know, not they don't care. And at the time I was, you know, 16, like no telling what I was getting into, you know? So I ended up moving with Stacy, and it was the right timing as well. It was, you know, what I needed, you know, Joyce was, you know, somebody I looked up to, you know, she was 19 and she was like a big sister, you know, but she was from Cali. So she had that like, fuck you, you know, type of mentality. And I liked that about her, you know, Stacy was, you know, like the mom that you wanted. She was hard as fuck on you and she wanted you to do better. But at the same time, she would stand up for you and have your back, you know, and they had a little daughter named Lulu that I used to babysit. I think she was nine at the time, but we went through some crazy times, you know, we went through some, you know, in that house was a lot of crazy things. It was, of course, no matter where I've ever been, ever since I've been at my mom's house, I was always the party house. And I feel like that's something that has to do with me. I was left alone so, so much, you know, as a young teen, you know, for my mom working at the hospital, my stepdad being a, a paramedic EMT, that I never wanted to be alone again, you know, and my, I moved out, there was nobody to talk to, and it was, there was a lot of nights I was at that house alone, I was going through things, and I was trying to figure out who I was, you know, and it would be days, it'd be like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, thank God they didn't have a ring back then, because I would have been in some shit, you know what I mean? Um, I'm glad that came out, you know, later on, but, um, there was just so much stuff like, you know, going on and I told myself, I I never want to be lonely. Like I'm lonely in this house, you know, and I, I just kept telling myself, I can't wait till I'm older. I can't wait till I'm older. I can't wait till I'm older because I wanted to, you know, move on. I wanted to just be, you know, I don't know. I wanted to be around people. I always want to be around people. I was always a people person. I always want to be around people. And I feel like my parents at that point were trying to shelter me to not be around people. And that's what was like causing so much drama too. Because, I mean, the time went from 11 to 8 to 6. You know, 6 in the afternoon. Like, I didn't even get out of school to 3. Like, when am I have like, two hours with my friends? Like, that's not fair, you know? Why everybody else, you know, can still stay out to seven to eight. Okay, eight, I can get it. You know, I'm 16 or whatever. But, I mean, everybody else is like 10, you know? Like, I can get, like, school don't even start. School, my school didn't even start till eight. So, you know, like, that's way more hours of sleep than I need. You know, I could have went to bed at midnight and still woke up for school at eight. So, at this point, I was emancipated and I ended up, I just got fired from McDonald's and I got fired for discrimination. Um, it wasn't even me I discriminated. Me and the fucking line cook was getting into it. So I was working fries and he was working. Um, I remember going to court over this shit too. It was so stupid. Um, I went to, I was working fries and my ex at the time came up to McDonald's. You know, he came up to see me because he was still in high school. You know, he was senior year. Like I said, he was senior year. I already dropped out. So he came up after high school and he was like, hey, you know, he ordered his food. He never got nothing for free. I never gave, you know, any like him anything from free because McDonald's watches you like a fucking hog. Like you give an extra sauce and they're ready to charge you on your paycheck. You know, like even for an extra sauce of like barbecue sauce. So I was like, you know what? You know, I charge him, but I did give him my discount, which was only like, I think 20% or some shit. So, or 25%. So I think he ordered like two hot and spicies and maybe double. But back then that was like $4. Now that's just like 10. But, um, and I think he only paid two or whatever. So remember the line cook was like 20, he was like 28. Remind you, I'm 16. Like, you know what I mean? And he made a comment like, oh yeah, you always have bagged ass boyfriends up here. Oh, no, we fighting. And I got mad. And, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to hold my tongue. And my ex, 
you know, he's six foot two and he's like built, light skinned. Like he's, you know, built. Like he's a football player. He's a fucking quarterback. So I mean, like he could have beat this dude up or whatever. But I'm also not gonna go down like no bitch either. Mm-hmm. So and we kind of fueled each other. He was like the bulldog, and I was like the chihuahua standing behind the bulldog. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? That was me. So I was like, well, he looked better than the fucking ugly ass bitches you be bringing up here. You know what I mean? And he got mad. He got so mad. He was like, don't be talking about my lady. They fat, ugly, disgusted. I was like, you might as well be fucking a man because the bitches you fucking with ugly as hell. And I was pissed. So I went back to making fries, and next thing I know, he in my face. So at this point, we're scrapping at in McDonald's, like fighting. And I got the fucking grease basket and I was like hitting him in the fucking face with it. And he was like choking me the whole time. And like, I didn't give a fuck. Like, you was not going to talk about my man. But see, he made him comments after my man got his food and left. You know, mm. so he wouldn't even lobby because he knows if he was in the lobby, he would have got his ass smeared. So I'm over there hitting him with the fucking fry basket as he's choking me. <laughs> you know, at that point, I was, you know, I was like, I was not even gonna lie, I was probably like 150 wet. Like, I was skinny as hell. You know, and I'm like hitting him with the fucking fry basket as he's like, whatever. So finally, they break us up or whatever. And, um, they break us up and they tell us both to clock out or whatever and we can go home. At that point, like, I'm like, whatever, I could walk home because my apartment that I was staying in was only like five minutes away. And, you know, the other dude had to take the bus and the train and every fucking thing else with his little broke ass. But uh-huh, broke um, man, broke boys. I don't talk to broke boys. Right. So um what happens? After that, I went home, and I remember, you know, they were asking me why, you know, I left or whatever. And I really could have sued McDonald's, honestly, because of how that shit not even my fault. He's the one that made the fucking for comments. He just did the backlash at the comments. But at the same time, how people were looking at it is, y'all made us both clock out at the same time and made us leave at the same time. Who's to say something couldn't happen after that? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I knew it wasn't. But you, you never know. You know what I mean? So, I remember having to go to court for that shit, and he was telling the judge how I beat him up and how he had pictures of his face with the fry basket. Because I it was in the oil, and I was hitting with it. You know what I mean? Good. The thing is, like, I had to remind the fucking judge, because they were trying to send me to fucking jail. I said, do you know I'm 16? Like, and this is 28. Like, are you serious right now? Grown-ass so, man beat up, try to fight a kid. We're not doing this. You know, if I wasn't a man, y'all wouldn't even be thinking this. You know, y'all would have sent him on the fucking death penalty. So, not that, but, you know, what I'm saying it's just... Yeah, so, I, like, I feel what you said. You know, they over that's right now, you know. So, I'm like, so why are y'all even entertaining this right now? So, ended up, the dude had to go through anger management, and he had to pay so much money and stuff like that. I didn't get shit. You know what I mean? And I felt like I should have got some shit, mm. you know? But I was like, whatever. You know, he had to pay, like, all these, like, fines and shit, and... He should have had to make you a gold to to frying like, pan, like, spray paint it gold, and, like, make you a, a, a trophy. Right. I should have had a, a trophy. Or something. So I ended up losing my job. Oh, man. I can't believe they, they, they took your job. I, right. Well, because you know, I'm well, whatever. I call it a victory I'm... because you won. You got it with the frying pan. That's a win, right? The little fry basket. I think you know. At the end of the day, like it just made me mad because I was like, you know, y'all fight. They did fire both of us. They told me I couldn't have my job back after reviewing the the cameras. But the thing is, like, I'm from the south and from the hood. Anything a weapon, like I don't, everything. You know, anything a weapon. So. I'm like, you know, we ain't going to do this. So, ended up, um, I ended up getting a job at KFC. And KFC, I stuck with from the time I was like 16 to the time I was like 21. Um, ended up working at KFC. And it was fun. I enjoyed it. I like the people I work with. I met like a lot of good people who helped me as well. They were so supportive, you know, 
my relationship with Will. They were so supportive of who I was. You know, one of my favorite people I ever worked with, KFC, was this lady. Her name was Miss A. She was like everybody's mama. And she was like a mama that you wish you had, you know, that was just so supportive and everything. And every time I go back to Shreveport, Louisiana, and I go to the KFC on Benton Road, I always, you know, have to go see her, you know, because she was always supportive. And she could relate with me in a lot of ways, but she could relate with me because I was going through everything early. You know, I'm 16, for God's sake. Like, going through, like, things that, you know, she didn't experience. So she was, like, in her 30s or either late 20s, and I'm 16 going through this, you know? And that's why she kind of took me under her wing, because she was like, I know what you're going through, you know? I know, you know, everything. And it was so hard to hide anything from her, because she knew, you know? And at that point, you know, I was also hanging around with the wrong crowd. You know, I was hanging out with a crowd that I wanted to be accepted for because, you know, it was a bunch of guys and it was, you know, females. And it was, you know, it was like four females and like 15 guys. And they were like a pack. You know, you hang out with one, you hang out with all of them. You know, they always had parties. They And I wanted to be that, you know, I wanted to hang out with that so bad. And I ended up did, but the thing is to hang out with them, you had to do certain things like drugs, you know? And I was like, well, I ain't got no parents. I ain't got this, you know, fuck it. I've never done drugs before. And I probably tried every fucking drug within three months <laughs> that was out there at that point. You know, and at that point, you know, Will, you know, Will was trying to help me a lot, you know, for drugs, you know, which, at that point, we were also starting to move in together and wanted to hang out with them so bad, but I also wanted to be with him. But, you know, I didn't want to choose. You know, I wanted to, like, do both. I'm, have my know, kid eat it too, yeah. Do drugs and then come home and hang out with you. Right. So, you know, I was doing drugs and I was a member of Miss A. <laughs> you can't hide nothing from her because she's done everything too her whole life. You know, she's been in so many situations and um, I remember I went to work you know, my eyes were like so dilated, like the pupil, I, I look like wolf eyes, like they just like took over my whole eye, you know, and she was like, what did you do last night? And I was like, oh girl, you know, I went to sleep, you know, and she was like, she didn't believe it one second. She was like, you know, like, what did you do? And I was like, no, I went to sleep, you know, and she was like, go to the bathroom and look at your eyes and then come back and tell me what you did last night, you know, and I went to the bathroom and I was like, what the fuck is going on? You know, my eyes were that dilated for like three days. And I know oh, what I did, no. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, I know I, what drugs I took, I know yeah. what I did. So I was yeah, I was just like, oh my gosh, like this is this is crazy, you know. And you know, my friends, you know, they were having parties, they were having bulldog fights, like everything fucking illegal, doing drugs, drinking, you know, everything illegal. But you know, smoking weed and stuff, you know, weed's illegal. So you know, we were like living it up. At the same time, Will was getting mad because I was never home, you know. And at this point, we're living together, and you know, when I would come home, I would be drunk or I'd be, you know, passed out you know, in the kitchen or, you know, passed out, you know, halfway onto the couch, you know, and, you know, he was getting tired of it. So at this point, he was starting to try to control me. And I, I was at the point to where I was lean vulnerable. Like, I didn't have parents. I didn't have, you know, I can do what I, I want to do and I want to live life, you know, and he was starting to control me to where I had to walk a certain way. I had to act a certain way. I had to talk a certain way. I had to eat a certain way, you know, and at the same time, we were broke. Like, you know, I'm the moneymaker. He's still in school. You know, I, he had a part-time job at like a family dollar, but I'm the one paying the bills around here. So, we, you know, we were getting kind of like not understand each other you know I wasn't trying to listen to him he wasn't trying to listen to me you know and we were just like you know starting to you know have like little complications or whatever so I was like you know F this you know I'm gonna do what I want to do but I ended up giving in you know I ended up listening to him one night you know he was crying or whatever and telling me you know like he doesn't want to wake up you know I'm passed out and can't get up and I'm drunk or you know I'm you know he didn't want me to go like whole Amy Winehouse you know 
and drink until I die, you know, and mm -hmm. I ended up, you know, cutting all my friends off and stuff like that and cutting off a lot of people and try to just stay, you know, with him and stuff like that. And it worked for a while. We had friends together, you know, he was still not out or whatever. And it worked for a while, you know, he, um, we got the apartment at the most ghetto hood apartment. It was $200 a week, come fairly, fully furnished. Like the dude upstairs was selling like drugs. Ended up, I remember I woke up one day to like police flashings to like the front of the house. And I'm like, what is going on outside? And I wake up outside and there's like a whole SWAT team, you know, and they're like getting the dude upstairs because he's like selling drugs. But at them apartments, you could pay about a week. You know, like you could live somewhere else, but you know, if you as long as you had two hundred dollars a week, you were good. Like they didn't care. So you know, and it was so because everybody was just like just ghetto over there. It was so funny, but I had the most fun over there. You walk outside, and like the lady next to you was having a cookout. And she's selling hot plates, and then you go out there. You know. You come home from work one day and they're having like a whole hot wing fry party and they're selling like hot wing trays, ten dollars. Like I'm like, shit, I'm broke. You know what I mean? But I get twenty hot wings surprise and a drink for like ten dollars. Like, hell yeah, like this is my type of shit. You know, and I just will never forget about it. It was called Homewood Apartments and they were a Shreveport. If you ever look them up, it's just so ghetto. But yeah, you, it was you so know, you can't replace that hood, that hood you uh, know. community. It's impossible. You can't, it's not a thing that's, it's anywhere else. You have to see people th who thrive in poverty to, to understand what the hood is like. It's not like they show in the movies. It's not like they show in any, any type of yeah document, documentary or any of that bullshit. They'll never really understand the hood. The hood is, is the neighborhood, the community, the, your neighbor going yeah. through the worst time in their life with a smile on her face because she's a single mom and she has motherfuckers around her that care that. Uh, amidst the, all the bullshit, amidst the drugs, amidst the violence, the gangs, that community factor is still there. Yeah, and, that, and that's something that it can't be. It can't be. The lady you can't buy that. The lady next door would pay me fifty dollars to take her to Walmart. You know, and at first I felt so bad taking the money until I really figured out how she was getting the money. You know, she I would take her to Walmart and she would come out with like two grocery carts full of shit. And she would end up stealing it, like not pay for it. And then she would go back in and take back some items. Me on a Walmart gift card, you know, because she would take back the items. And I was like, you know, I'm just here. Like, I'm I don't here. I don't go in with you. I'm just, you know, the getaway car, you know, um, to where I started doing that, you know, <laughs> because I was broke, like shit, like, you know what I mean? And um, the lady down the street, the state and apartment complex, her house was like the house where you bought, you know, she was like the candy lady. You get cigarettes there. You get cigarettes, you get, you know, cold cups, you get hot wings, you get, you know, that was like my late night, you know, after work stop. Like, instead of going to a corner store, I went to the candy lady house, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would go there for twenty dollars, I done got cigarettes, something to eat, you know, some ice cream, some like gummies, you know, like stuff that you want, an alcohol beverage for twenty dollars. And you know, I try to tell people that like the hood, you know, definitely on what you see on TV is, you know, maybe some hoods, but not every hood is like that. Yes, there is gang activity. Yes, there is shooting. Yes, there is stuff like that. But it's not as I guess, like, on a movie, it's, it's like, every day type yeah, thing. Movies, like, that yeah. would be, like, once. Like, yeah. It's not, it's, yeah, it happens, but it's not, like, an everyday situ situation. You know, there's block parties. There's parties you go to. And, you know, everybody in the hood is smoking weed. Like, no cops. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just, like, free for all living, you know? And I I do miss that, that part, you know, but it really makes me mad when like people like you know in the military they're always like I'm from the hood I'm from the hood okay from the hood is not like a flex like that's it's not, not like a lifestyle flex. like I there's nothing fun flex about to my friends poverty. like I'm... like people live through that shit like if there's nothing yeah it's I, not I, a flex. I get out of the hood if like I always yeah. talk, talk to the youth you know and I go out and do motivational speaking and things like that and interacting with the youth in the, in the region they're they're loving these music they don't have a filter so they're just loving 
uh, King Vaughn talk about, you know, carrying a piece, you know, pull a steady, pull a steady watching me so I keep that Glock on me. You know, uh, you know, there's nothing fun about being in fear of your life 24 seven. There's nothing fun about being in, in poverty. There's nothing fun about thinking selling drugs is your best form of your, your future. Is nothing positive about it. Get the fuck out of the hood. Leave the hood. You know, come back if you can and buy a part of the hood. Make the hood better. Open up more jobs. Do something. But uh, avoid the... Well, like, they I try to stay to, out the hood. They listen to these rappers and, you know, they sit here and say like, oh, you know, I want to I wanna be in a cartel. Okay, here's the thing no, about the, the fuck hood. You don't. <laughs> you don't just go to somebody's hood start selling drugs because that's the first way you're going to get off. Yeah, 100%. You know what I mean? Because you're going into somebody else's territory and selling the same shit. Selling. That's the first way that you're going to get killed. You and that's how you car go fire. from the hood or not, is when they start saying here, you're like, you're 18 and... Yeah. You're like, you're 18 and you was the big homie and the big Don. I don't think so. Because no. Big Hunt John is like 60 years old. Like, they 50. is not no 18 year old. Like, that's no, the like, first like way you're going to get shot in the hood. Uh, because the that, and that's exactly what it was. People, people would be in the hood and they'd be. Even the candy ladies were fighting. So just imagine, you know what I mean? Like, somebody selling fucking, you know, drugs in another hood that's already owned by somebody else. And they try to sit here and say, like, yeah, in the hood, I was just, I just listen. I'm like, uh huh, because that's not a flex. You know yeah, what I mean? Biggest like, talk, biggest talkers are the smallest so walkers. And the loudest yeah, motherfucker like, in a dark room gets shot first every time. So they better, they better, you know, keep it a hundred. Like if you, if you ain't about the hood shit, don't say you about the hood shit. If you, if you don't, like I carry a piece on me because I'm uncomfortable in regular life all the time. So I, I can, I, you know, if I'm not under the influence of alcohol or, or you know, do anything that equates firearm responsibility. Fuck yeah, I got my piece on me. I seen some shit. I, I'm right. not trying to get caught up. It it is what it is. No, hell no. Right. Hell no. It's too alpha up in this bitch. Just because you live in the hood or you're from the hood doesn't mean I'm in the game. Like yeah. you know what I mean? Like not everybody, you know, and that's why I try to tell people, like, not everybody from the hood is in the game. Like just, you know, most people just support it. Two hundred dollars a week, like you can't beat that. Like I couldn't beat that nowhere else in Louisiana. Mother wanted like thousands of dollars to stay in the neighborhood, or you know, even apartments. Two hundred dollars a week, and everything, cable, Wi Fi, you know, water, electricity, everything. You know what I mean? I couldn't get that. Most places eight hundred dollars plus. They wanted you to pay for cable, Wi Fi, and all this on your own. And you know, I was just like. I can't do that you know I can do $800 and that's it because that was pretty much my paycheck my paycheck was about $700 every two weeks and it was $800 a month to stay you know where I was staying so that was all I could do plus gas and there were nights that I do remember I worked at KFC because there were nights I remember I had dollars for you know a week and a half $30 either had to get me to work or I had to eat Know, and thank God for KFC because I would take food home. You know, that would be dinner. You know, I had to get, you have to get in the hood, you have to get really resourceful. And, you know, yes. I would have to debone that chicken and put it in, debone the chicken from KFC and put it in like a rice or debone the chicken and make, you know, a chicken salad or debone the chicken. And, you know, like there was certain things you have to do, you know. I want to eat KFC chicken every night for, you know, two weeks. So you had to like do like creative stuff, you know. You couldn't use the whole bag of shrimp for, you know, shrimp fried rice. You had to cut it in pieces. You know, there was certain things you had to do to survive. And you have to get resourceful. You know, you have to, you know, thank God for McDonald's and Taco Bell dollar menu and Circle K Thirst Busters, 86 cents and a big 86 drink. 86 you know? motherfucking cents. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Thank God they had that because if they didn't have that, I don't know how I was surviving. Man, because... come on now. That's how I know. You know what? It, if if there's anybody who listens to this or anybody knows you and they try to pull your hood card, they ain't got they got shit to say. You know, you know what you you know what it's like to go through some shit, man. For real, for real. Right. I remember I was scrap, scrapping up change for that eighty six cent thirst buster. You know what I mean? I didn't even have a dollar to my name, and I was 
couch cushion. Anytime I was at KFC and they said kept the change, I sure did. Okay. <laughs> this is gonna be my Dr. Pepper tonight. So Yes, Lord. There, you know, there were certain things that, you know, you did. And at that time, you know, Will Will, he was finally graduating high school, I think. It was like the next big step of, you know, our life. And I was so excited because now he could finally get a job, you know, and he was waiting to go to college. And, you know, we made a deal that, you know, he would go to college and then, you know, I would go to college after and stuff like that because he already had, you know, a college degree because, you know, he played sports and stuff like that. So he ended up going to LSU because he wanted to be a physical therapist. And I was so excited and I was so happy. So I was like, yes, yes, yes. You know, um, the college he was going to was about an hour, about an hour away from where we stayed, maybe 45 minutes, but with traffic about an hour away. Um, I was in a KFC. I ended up getting two jobs. Um, because I wanted to move out of the hood. I went out. Like, I wanted at least, like, no yes. class, you know. So I ended up working at Smashburger and KFC. Um, <clears throat> I was working at both. Smashburger was my favorite job in the world. I mean, it even beats the Navy. Uh, I do love my job. Smashburger was just so fun. It was, you made $7 an hour plus tips, you know. Um, it was just fun. It was so easy. It was so easy. Um, and I just enjoyed it. You know, the people, the type of environment it was in, you know, we ended up moving from the hood to Quail Creek Apartments, which are now called like River Riverside Apartments, you know, and it was by Barksdale Force Base, which is in Shreveport. So, we, you know, by the Air Force Base, so we were by like a lot of Air Force people, you know, and these apartments were so nice and it, it was bigger. It wasn't so congested. I mean, because I mean, the apartments we were staying in, I mean, the living room, ki kitchen and, you know, dining room were just all connected. You know, I mean, it was like one big, it was the size of my living room now, you know, with a bathroom. So this place was like an actual apartment and we could actually move furniture in. And I remember, you know, for our furniture, we were getting it from Walmart, we would dumpster dive in, we, you know, I mean, we would do anything just to get some furniture around the area, you know, around, you know, the apartment. And at this point, he was going to college. And I think college is what kind of started a shift, like, in our relationship. Um, I was very scared. Of, I was very skeptical about him going to college anyway, because I know college is, you know, it's just kind of like, it's just, it's a lot of temptation, you know, and I was young at the time, you know, I didn't, you know, want him to feel physically attracted to someone else. Or in, at the time, like, I'm working two jobs and it's, you know, it was just hard for us to see each other, you know, and um, he's going to college and stuff like that. But I will never forget the time, um, you know, I didn't do, I don't, I still don't condone in the whole cheating thing. Like, if you're going to cheat on me, let's just stay where we are. You know, let's not be in a relationship. Let's just yeah. be who we are. You know, friends, friends have been, you know. But if you're going to cheat on me, or you think you're going to have that, then we can't be together, you know. And I've always been, I've always been about loyalty first. You know, even with my friendships, if you don't show, if you can't show me loyalty, then I can't be friends with you, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember I invited my friends over, you know, I haven't seen them at this point. It's been like eight, nine months, you know, I invited them over to my house. And this is when beauty shop, we were, we were watching beauty shop because how I used to have to get movies to watch. Cause William had, at this point we're living together. I'm out of Stacy's. I'm out of Joyce's, you know, we're living together. We done moved from one place to another, you know, all we have is an Xbox Wi-Fi, you know, and a flat screen TV, that we got from fucking Renner Center and we're still sleeping on a fucking blow up mat mattress, you know, um, still living off KFC because I mean, even with two jobs, you know, this place was more expensive. It was the $800 a month, which is what we were paying at the other place. But now we have to pay for bills, you know, and it's farther from my jobs, you know, my other job where we stayed, I could walk to, you know, now it's like a 10 minute, 15, 10, 12 minute drive. So I remember I was, <laughs> for me to get anything to watch on TV, I had to go steal it from the $5 band of Walmart, you know? So I ended up getting the movie Beauty Shop and, you know, I wanted, you know, 
all my homegirls are like, let's watch Beauty Shop. Let's with Queen, Queen Latifah. I never forget this. We were watching it and we kept hearing this like ding, you know. And he, his, Will, his parents were rich. His dad is like retired Air Force and his mom had like a beauty supply store or whatever. I mean, his parents were probably not rich, but well off, you know. Mm. Um, So we kept hearing an Apple book, Apple MacBook. So we kept hearing this ding go off. And I'm like, well, I don't have no fucking doorbell, so I don't know what it is. So, you know, like, we'll pause in the movie, and we're, like, trying to find, like, what's going on? What's going on? We're, you know, we're making it a game at this point. You know, everybody's drinking. We, you know, we're like, oh, it's fine to sound. It's fine to sound. It's fine to sound. And it's fucking MacBook. Well, I knew all of his passwords and everything. And come to find out, he downloaded some text now app, and he was talking to some dude at his college. So at this point, like, I'm pissed. You know what I mean? I'm reading the text messages and it's like, oh, meet me at the library. You know, let's do this. Let's do that. You know, let's talk. And I'm thinking, he don't even take me. At this point, I'm thinking, he don't even take me on no date. So how the fuck he go about to meet somebody else at the fucking library? I'd be damned. So I'm like, so my homegirls are like, what we about to do? What we about to, you know, they ratchet and shit. I'm like, well, we about to pull up on them. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was that's talking, a part of the issue. I was, I was my ass, but they were for real. So I was like, okay, let's do it. So, you know, he I was driving 45 minutes away to his college, you know, I got my backpack on from like high school, you know what I mean? Trying to act like I'm a student. And like, I remember going to the library and like, I went off, you know, I like slammed my shit down on the library and I was like, you got me fucked up. Da, 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 don't worry about coming home. All your shit gonna be out fucking side. Like, you know, I'm going off. You know, I'm ratchet at that point, smelling like fucking cigarettes and everything else. Like, drunk as hell, like, don't matter about coming, don't come back to the house, because all your shit gonna be out fucking like, side. If you come back to the house, like, don't even worry about it. Like, this is like, going off. Talk ass, everything. So, we run back, I run back to the car, and I'm like, go, 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 go. Taking off. We're going back to the house. We get back to the house clothes belts everything like I, I we had like a little box so we had like a little patio that was like stone and i just remember like burning his shit his polo shirts his vest his like sh- everything cutting his belts creasing his fucking shoes like i didn't give a fuck pouring orange soda all over his shit um because that was his favorite drink orange soda like orange man i was pouring that shit all over his shit got me fucked up you know what I mean? Like, throwing away his, like, ring, our engagement ring. Like, I was mad, you know? And it was all fun and cute and shit until he came home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because at this point, like, we're fighting. You know what I mean? Like, we're fist fighting. You know, everybody's just like, what's going on? You know, William's, like, bigger than me. He's, like, six foot two. Six, 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 six foot two, six foot three. Plays foot, you know, play football. You know I mean, and, I mean, we're scrapping because I wasn't backing down. You know, but his senior ring, he had a senior, his senior ring on. You know, it ended up scratching, like, my face. It's like a scar. You can see it in the light, but it goes, like, right here oh, from where he yeah. punched me, and the senior ring goes out. And, like, I was bleeding. I couldn't believe he punched me, like, so hard. Like, I couldn't believe I was bleeding. You know, scrapping is one thing, but, like, me bleeding? Oh, shit, he's for real. So, at this point... What's going on is, like, you drew blood from me. I'm about to draw blood from you. Like, that's how I look at it, right? So I pissed. So I get the knife. You know what I mean? And I'm about to stab him. I'm like, I don't care if I go to prison. I don't care if I go to jail. Like, I'm about to stab this motherfucker. So I'm over there trying to stab him. And my sis, like, my best friend, my sister, comes over and takes the knives out of my hand. Like, as we're fighting. And I just... I was like, I was really about to stab him. <laughs> I couldn't stab him no more. And you just like took it away from me. And she was like, you don't want to end your life like that. You don't want to go to prison. I ain't none of that. I'm like, fuck you, bitch. You a fake bitch. You know what I mean? Like all this, all that. So I ended up going to the bathroom shower and I came out and like William was there and he was like, I'm, I'm so sorry. And I was like, I don't even want to talk right now. Like, I don't even, like, I'm so tired. The adrenaline has just wore off. Like, I just took, like, a three-hour bath. Like, the adrenaline has wore off. Like, I can't even talk right now. Like, we tomorrow, like, I'm done. You know? So, we ended up getting close again or whatever. 
you know, talking, working it out, things like that. I was still mad that he fucking, you know, cut my fucking eye. You know, it was healing. I was still going to work with fucking, I went to work with a black eye. I remember um, fucking Miss A, nosy, nosy lady. She was like, like, what's going on? You know, and like, you know, I, I've been there, you know, and I was just like, it's not what you think. And she was telling me like, you know, you can't make excuses for the people that, you know, and there's certain things that people would tell you in life that you still use to this day. One of them things was that, like, you can't make excuses for, you know, people you love. And that's so true because there's been many times that people would try to make an excuse for somebody that they love, you know. Oh, you know, he, he does drugs because, you know, like, he's not happy with his life or, you know, even parents, you know, like, oh, my son's not, he's not, he's not a murderer. He's not this, he's, you know, people will make excuses for, you know, people that they love all the time, you know, and you realize that in life that you see it all the time, you know, and it's like, you know, that's what's wrong with some people is that they keep making excuses for that, you know, like, so, you know, your, your child is just a fucking monster. Like, I hate to break it to you, but I mean, that's what it is. No, your daughter is just a hoe. Like, you know what I mean? Like, just get with it. Like, stop making excuses for, you know, your people. Like, admit what it is and try to move past that. No, your son is just a drug addict. And I remember she said that, and I was just like, damn, like, she's, like, preaching to me a real shit. At this same point, I'm still doing drugs. Like, on the side, like, that nobody knows. Like, William don't know, nobody knows, but uh, Miss A knew. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. couldn't hide nothing from that, from her. You know? Um, so... We ended up going, like, better. And um, what was the next thing after the big, this argument? I, I could never trust him again. So, you know, at that I had, like, a lot of people, you know, trying to talk to me and stuff like that. So I was like, you know, maybe I need a plan B. You know what I mean? Maybe I need to be the one that needs to be worried about. Maybe I need to be the one that's over here see if he'll fight for me like I did for him type shit. You know, that's what was going through my head. You know, at the same time, I'm also like, you know, drinking and on drugs. So maybe it didn't sound as good as what I thought it was going to be. I thought he was going to be like my knight in shining armor. I thought he was going to propose like again. Like I thought it was going to be, it didn't go like that. So, um, cause he did propose. So when I got my GED, I Definitely left that out. But when I got my GED, I walked across the stage and he came up to the stage and proposed in front of like everybody. Like everybody I went to GED class with. Um, my mom was there, you know, um everybody. Your know, mom ended up coming down to see me get my GED. Um and I was just so excited. At that point, I really um it was nice for her, you know, I wanted to show her. I didn't need her, you know, mm-hmm. and I was so excited and I feel like a lot of people were excited for me. So, I, you know, I thought, you know, if I talked to somebody else, maybe he would you know, do all the sweet things that I don't know what was going through my head. So started talking to other people, but I was never going to do nothing. That was I, my intent was never doing anything. It was just to make him jealous. Well, I think I made him a little bit too jealous because the dude was texting me and I ended up at the gas station. I left my phone like in the car. Just like I knew his passwords. He knew my fucking passwords. You know, the password to my phone, 1994. Like, everybody fucking know. You know what I mean? So he like read the text messages, you know? And of course I was playing along with it and we're on the highway and I'll never forget this. This is a, this is something else that pissed me off. Um, he threw me out. Like, in the middle of the fucking highway, like, on a high, like, highway, you know, kicked me out and threw my phone. And I had to walk, like, nine miles back to the fucking house. Like, we were nine miles away. I remember I started at two, and I didn't get back to the house. To- yes. Started at two, and then get back to the house at eight. And I just remember... I was just like, no phone. All I had was $2 in my pocket. I ended up stopping and get me a thirst bus. Because <laughs> I was thirsty, you know. And he never came back for me. And I just felt like, 
you know, he's going to come back in an hour or two. I'll just start heading that way. And it started me being like, okay, like, is he ever going to come? You know, I have nobody to call to pick me up, nothing. I ended up going back to the house and like, everybody was there. All his friends were there, you know, and they were just all staring at me. And my, even my homegirl fake bitch was there. And they were like, you know, like, I wanted to go back for you, you know. And I'm thinking, bitch, he don't control you. You could have came back for me, bitch. You know, and they were like, you're not going to fight him. I'm like, I have walked nine miles. And it has took me, like, a second day. I'm tired. I have no energy today to fight it. But all I can think about is when I hit that pillow, I was like, as soon as I get up tomorrow, I'm fighting. You know what I mean? Like, so I, there was definitely I, some some serious dysfunction. There was definitely a lot of a lot of, I would say, it passion passion ingested. Right? You 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 ate in a lot of passion, and you dealt out a lot of passion. Whether it was, you know, all fun times or all bad times, it was definitely yeah. times. Right? Yeah, I remember he was like laying beside me the next morning, and I like got up and stood up in the bed, and it was just like pick like. Stepping on his fucking face, I was pissed. And I was like, that's the all the times, all the fucking miles I had to walk, and we started scrapping again. I think that was the last time we actually fought fault. I was really pissed. Like, and he ended up leaving. I didn't give a fuck. Um, you know, I was just so pissed, you know, and at the same time, like now I have to get a new fucking phone. You know what I mean? So because my phone's broken, like he took the memory card out of my and ended up like breaking my phone and threw it. So I was like, fuck this shit, you know? And I think time went by. We ended up getting close to, you know, I gave him like a thing, you know, like you can leave. Like everything, this apartment is in my name, you know, I'm my own car, you know, anything I can do myself because at this point, I think. I was, you know, 18, 19. I had to be, yeah, 18, 19. Like, at this point, I can live out on my own. Like, I can do this. You know, I have two jobs. You know, it ain't for me to go find somebody else. You know, do I want to? No. But if I have to, I will. And I kind of gave him, you know, I guess like an ultimatum. Like, you know, like, we worked this out or you can leave. And I think, you know, he worked with it. And we ended up getting closer. I feel like there was a lot of demons following both of us because, you know, here I am, like, and, you know, here he is, you know, finally coming out, you know, to his people, you know, friends he's known since, you know, elementary school, and here he is having to explain to his parents, you know, that he's the only child, technically, because his sister, you know, was um, in a wheelchair and she was kind of like mentally challenged, you know, to where here the only child technically that can have kids or produce kids is, you know, gay, you know, and the only son, you know. And I think he was going through a lot of things too because we'll never forget the day that like I came home after we had that like agreement and, you know, he was crying, you know, and he was crying like on the sofa. And what I with the same tears that, like, I cried, like, you know, at the church, you know, and he was like, I don't want to be gay, you know, I don't, I don't, I love you, but I don't want to, you know, and I think the words hurt me a lot because here I am, sacrifice everything, you know, to hear the person that I love and that I care about saying the same things that I also asked about and how could I judge him because I also went the same thing you know and Mm. I feel like at that point too it was it was a lot of it was a lot of like hard time you know during that month you know it was do I do I sleep beside you or do you know you go to the living room tonight you know like are we still together like do you look at in that type of way you know and I don't want to you know, rush you on anything, and I don't want, you know, like, I I wanted him to love me the way that I loved him at that point, you know, and um, I think it was hard, because I think it was a lot of people getting into his head, and people getting into his head that I wasn't around for, you know, mm-hmm. and um, 
it was hard. It was very hard. It was very overwhelming. It was, you know, there were, there were days. I, yeah. And, yeah. And yeah. With, torn with himself, torn with his relationship, torn with the situation. And, and, and you were as well, you know, it was, um, it, it takes time to, to give, to learn how to give your partner some grace when they're going through something and, and to, it takes time for your partner to give you some grace when you're going through things. It, it definitely yeah. is not, it's not an easy road. There's no pathway to, to figuring out this relationship thing. It's, it's never, <laughs> ever, ever, ever easy. So I definitely have a, a pretty good understanding of the, the ups and the downs that you, you face with this person. You're not just finding out who they are. They're finding out who they are. You're finding out your, how, how the, the experiences and the traumas that you you've dealt with at a young age have, you know, looking back in hindsight, it can never be easy. And I appreciate you, you being transparent and talking about being emancipated at, at 16, um, finding out who you were and being treated it poorly for it. It's, it's all bullshit to me, uh, the yeah. way that you were treated. And it, it really is. I wish that people, um, gave you, gave you some grace and understood that, that just cause society doesn't understand who you are, doesn't mean that they can't take the time to learn. So you, your partner learning who he was and, you learning who you were could not have been easy. So I, I just want to commend you for going through that and, and, and still being here today. It's not, e and ne nothing in life is easy. You have to make it easy and society has to make it easy for you. But um, it, in, in your case, you, you had an uphill fight. Yeah. Um, I think at this point, I was around, yeah, 19 and, I think now we've got over the whole situation of, you know, who he was, you know, and he ended up finally coming out. I think a lot of it was he didn't want to come out. And when he did, a lot of people didn't believe it. You know, a lot of people thought he was joking. You know, for the longest time, people thought he was dating my sister and I just lived at the house on the couch, you know, because anytime his friends came over, you know, my sister was over there and. Um, my youngest sister on my dad's side, not my oldest sister, <laughs> clearly, but um, my youngest sister on my dad's side, and everybody thought they were dating, and they were always close, and it would always kind of hurt to see, like, them, like, hold hands at the movies and stuff like that, or, you know, try to play this persona, because, I mean, she had her own boyfriend, you know, but, you know, she would do it for me type thing, and to see them, you know, what I wanted to be, you know, and with him was hard. But at the same time, I was just happy that he was there, you know, that I didn't really think about it as much, I guess you could say. And um, I just really cared about him and I cared about his image. You know, I know that was like really big for him, his pride and his image. Um. At this point, he came out, and a lot of people, like, thought it was a joke, or they thought it was, you know, fake, and, you know, it was a real thing, and I was so happy because we were finally able to, like, face the world with us, you know, going out in the South and in a fairly small metro area, you know, it's pretty much found, frowned upon when you know, two guys are like holding hands and it wasn't even like we were like down each other's throat or anything. You know, we were just holding hands and people were just acting like we were just making a porno. You know, it was the way people looked at us, you know, and especially that and then us being a mixed relationship as well. You know, I, you know, I got called like all types of things like, oh, you inward lover or race, you know. Yeah, or you know, you 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 bunny, or um, you know, just you know, things snow bunny, this that, like you know, just certain things, and it was just kind of like you know, I, you know, I dealt with all of that and still like did not care because you know I was dealing with it with the person I love, you know, and love blinds you, and I didn't understand that when I was younger. Um, but it blinds you from the mistakes that people made. You know, William could have robbed a bank and I would have thought the best thing of him. You know, like he could 
kill somebody and I still would have thought the world's in hand. And it also blinds you from the negativity around you. You know, when people said things, it didn't drive me from him. If if anything, it brought me closer to him. It made me want to be with him more. It made me want to, you know, be in a relationship even longer, you know, because, you know, there's so many people against us. And I just felt like, you know, I wanted, you know, like, I just, I, I for him, like, I didn't want nothing else. Like, I didn't care about homeless with him, you know, um, and he was going to college and he was, you know, doing his own thing. And I was just so proud of him. Every accomplishment, I was proud of him, you know. But I think I would get kind of sad because I wanted him to be proud of me the way that I was proud of him, you know. And I don't think that he ever was as proud of me as I was proud of him, you know. And that that would always cause like a little, you know, argument or things because, you know, it wasn't four or five months ago you were telling me that you didn't want to be gay and now I just need to make sure like this is real. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I need to make sure like we're together for real. You know, I don't, I can never say that I really always questioned his love because there was a lot of things, you know, he did. Um, you know, one thing I like, you know, about him in a relationship is like he wouldn't let people get close to me. You know, like when we went to a bar or even like when we went to, you know, because bars out, you know, in the South were like 18 to enter, 21 to drink, you know. So anytime we went to a bar, we went to, you know, a club or anything, anybody come near me, like he was like on, like right there. You know what I mean? Like, why are you trying to talk to him? You know what I mean? Like ready to fight him and shit. I would always be the one like, well, chill, like he's cool, he's cool, you know. And he'd be like, no, nah, like I don't like this motherfucker, like he's talking too close to you, you know. And I kind of liked that about him because he was like my personal bodyguard, you know what I mean? Like I always thought like that was the like coolest thing, you know, um, about our relationship because like people couldn't disrespect me, you know what I mean, while we were out. Um, it was a lot being with him because, like I said, I was on a certain diet. I was on, there was a certain way I had to walk, there was a certain way, you know, I had to do things, you know, a certain way I had to dress, you know. Um, that thing, that part, I think, was a little controlling, you know. Um, looking back, it was really controlling. But at the time, I was like, you know, I'll do anything for my man, you know. Um, you know, I was on a strict diet. I was, you know, I you know, how to eat salad or sandwiches, or, you know, light stuff, you know, I couldn't eat, you know, what I wanted to eat, but I just thought that was part of a relationship. And I think every relationship comes with something, you know, it's just whatever you deal with, you know, um, but that was something that, you know, was going through, you know, and the clothes that I wore had to be tight, they couldn't be baggy, you know, like, it was just certain things, you know, um, the way I walk, you know, I had to walk into a room like I owned it. Like, I couldn't walk into a room just like a regular person. Like, he wanted people to stare at me. I feel like he wanted people to stare at me so they would want to talk to me so he could fight them. I don't know. That was my theory. But, <laughs> or he could have a problem with somebody. Like, I just feel like that was his type. So, you know, even to this day, like, that's how I walk into a room. And it's not because of that. It's just, it was just so normal that now know how to walk the other way or I don't know how to talk a certain any other certain way you know um so you know he definitely made me have ways of getting noticed um towards the age of 19 um we were having you know um we were starting to have like an argument about something and you know like I told him you know like well you you know you got me fucked up you know what I mean like you can leave like I don't care about anything you got to say like you can like get out you know what I mean? Like, get the fuck out. You know, like, I've always, at the end of the day, if anybody's had me, it's always been myself. You know, nobody is ever going to have me like I have myself. So at the end of the day, like, I'm going to make sure I'm good. You know what I mean? Like, get out. You know, and he did. He left. And I was kind of, like, really hard for that he left. But at the same time, I was mad. Like, I don't care. You know what I mean? And I just shouldn't feel like I should care. You know, I was like, you're the one who fucked up. Like you, we had this argument and it was over something stupid too. It was over like laundry or something. Like, I don't know, but it just escalated because I feel like people hide. Like when you're having, like when you're thinking of something, like every little thing that this motherfucker does now is going to piss you off. So, you know, 
it wasn't just the laundry. It was the fucking shoes that you left in the fucking front door. Or it was because you used my car and didn't fill it up with no gas. It was everything in one. And I feel like the laundry just, just like set it off. So at this point, I was home get out. He got out and he went to his mom's house. I knew where the fuck he was going. I wasn't stupid. But I was like, you know, um, it was it was like in the afternoon. It had to be like one or two. And it started being like eight or nine. So I texted him and I was like texting him like all kinds of crazy shit. Like if you don't get your ass back, like da 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 da. So I was calling him nonstop like 30, 40, 50, 60 times. I don't know how many times I called him. You know, I used to uh, try to win the DJ shit on the radio. So I'm gonna call you until you motherfucking answer. So you know what I mean? So I was mad. So he finally answered and he was like, you know, I'm drunk. I'm, you know, I'm at my mama's house. I, was like, I don't give a fuck. I was like, you know, you don't make it back tonight. Don't ever message me again. He knew I was for real. Like, when I said, like, don't ever like that, like, he knew I was for real. So, you know, um, I went to take a shower. I really didn't care if he was coming back or not. So, you know, I went to take a shower. Back when Adele was, like, big, I was listening to Adele. Like, yeah, fuck this motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we could have had it all, you know, rolling in the deep. Like, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I was listening to Adele, like, having a whole concert in the fucking shower, you know. How it goes, three hour showers and shit. So ended up, you know, I was drinking like Fort Locos at that time. Cause I mean, when you're young, that's all you can get people to buy you. So I mean, uh, I was, you know, drinking Fort Locos in the house by myself. I ended up like, like getting like getting comfortable and going to bed. It's like, damn, this motherfucker's still in here. You know, it's been like 30, 40 minutes. I know his mama only stayed 20 minutes away. You know, so I was like, whatever. You know, tomorrow, that's that's tomorrow's battle. You know, that's what I would always tell myself when I go to sleep. And I always had a battle between, like, people at work or people, you know, that's tomorrow's battle. I can't can't do it today. I'm going to do that tomorrow. So I ended up going to sleep. And, like, I woke up. And some days he would either be beside me with his, you know, 300-pound arm on me. Or he would be, you know, in... um. He'd be in the living room, you know, sleeping on the couch. So, you know, of course, the first thing I do, you know, I don't even brush my teeth. I don't even do that. I go right to the living room, see if he's up in there. And he wasn't in there. And I was like, oh, this motherfucker thought I was playing. Well, I got time today. You know, like, I, I was like, I got energy today. I'm not tired no more. So, you know, like, I'm calling his phone. It's going straight to voicemail. And it's, like, pissing me off. You know, I'm brushing my teeth. Whatever. So, at that point, you know, I Facebook was still kind of fairly new, but, you know, I had Android and, you know, Metro PCS, Metro piece of shit, that's what I called it, but, um, <laughs> you know, you didn't have, like, apps, like, Facebook app wasn't, I don't think it was a thing yet, like, maybe it was, but I didn't, you had to actually go on to Facebook.com on your internet browser and actually, like, um, you know, like really post shit on Facebook. And I wasn't posting nothing on Facebook. You know, I didn't have time for that. You know, I just wasn't a big Facebook person at that point. And I was remember I was um, brushing my teeth and I was listening to Adele still, you know, that was back when you could download music from your phone, you know, phone to E3 or whatever the fuck it was called. You know, they had little apps where you could load illegal music or whatever. Um, and I was listening to Adele and my homegirl calls me and she was like, oh, did did you, you know, did you see, you know, the stuff about Will posted, you know, that was on Will's, I think she, she worded it into a way to make it seem like William did it. I think she said, did you see what was on Will's page, page or something like that? And I was like, oh, no, fuck that motherfucker. Like, he had me fucked up. He had me pissed off. Like, fuck him. Like, I kicked his ass out. That's what the fuck he get. Like, fuck him. I don't care if he's homeless. You know, like, just going off. Like, at that point, I was having, like, a 30-minute conversation to myself. You know what I mean? Because she wasn't even listening. And she was like, you know, you need to go on to, you know, Facebook and read his wall and, you know, like, read, you know, stuff. And then, you know, call me back. And I was like, yeah, fuck him. I don't care what he had to say. And what I was thinking was going to be on his wall was, like, how he really loves me or something like that. Because every now and then he would, you know, we'd have, like, a little argument and he would post some shit like that. So I was just, you know, I, that was just a norm thing, you know. So I was just like, well, maybe he posted some shit. Well, you know, of course I act like I didn't care, but I really did. You know what I mean? So uh, I'm, like, brushing my teeth. I'm, like, after I brush my teeth, let me get a drink. You know, I always have to be comfortable before I do anything. So I'm like, 
let me get a drink. Let me make sure, you know, the music is on. Let me make sure, you know, everything, you know, the sun is perfectly in the house, you know, like. So I like get on Facebook and like I log on and I go straight to his page, you know, like it's like work. And, you know, like I see it's like random people, you know, posting, you know, like, you know, going online, it's just like, rest in peace, rest in peace. You know, we went to high school together. We went, you know, like we played football together, you know, it's pictures of, you know, like him playing football and it's, you know, like him, you know, at, at prom and there's pictures of, you know, like him with friends and us together and, you know, and I, I remember looking at it, I was like, <laughs> thought it was a lie at first, you know, and I I was like reading it and and then I strolled down and, you know, it was this truck and it was, you know, crashed and I I was like, there's no way, you know, like I was like, there's no way. And I got so angry, you know, and I like threw my phone like across like the room. Like I just remember screaming, like at the top of my lungs and just like throwing my phone, you know, and I you know, looked and I couldn't believe it, you know, and I didn't know what to do. My heart was racing, you know. Um, all of a sudden, you know, I was so hungry, and all of a sudden I wasn't, you know. And I was choked up. I couldn't talk, you know. I just felt like there was so much pressure in my throat, and there was so much pressure, like, in my chest. And I ended up calling my homegirl, and I, all I could do was dial, you know. I couldn't even speak, and, you know, she was telling me, you know, um, I know this is hard and I know this is a lot going on and I know you're there and you, you, you just don't want to speak. And I couldn't believe that he, you know, left, you know. And looking back, I was so heartbroken. I, I felt it, you know, in your heart. Like, I felt it, like, in my heart. Like, I don't know how to explain it. I guess people have to go through something like that to understand what that means. You know, but you feel it's like a whole, a piece is broken off your heart, you know, or a shell is broken or there's a crack in your heart. I don't know. And I just felt so much pain and I didn't know what to do. You know, I like listened to her and I went to, um, I wrote, read this article years later about like seven, seven like stages of depression or maybe it was eight or something like that or seven steps of something I think it was of depression grief. but it was like either five six yeah of grief or something yeah and at the time I didn't know what that was but reading in the future and going back I went through all them you know seven stages to where it was you know you go into denial you you know you're in denial about everything you know I was blowing his phone as if he was going to answer and I already knew the truth maybe it was like, you know I didn't know if it was his friend playing a joke on me, if it was, you know, really just the truth, you know, and um, I went through, you know, where you blame yourself, you know, you blame yourself and then you blame them and then you're angry. And, you know, I went through all of that and I couldn't eat, you know, I think I was only like 155 at that point. And I think I went down to like 140 to where people were asking me, was I sick, you know, um, when I would go out in town know and oh you need to eat and you know I haven't ate in like five or six days but I would tell people I just ate you know and uh, I would I was doing drugs and I was heavy and I couldn't because I needed the pain to stop you know? and find an outlet for the pain to stop and you know I hit up my old friends and there were nights you know I ended up losing the apartment and because I just couldn't go to work and I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't work you know, I, I ended up losing the apartment and I got a second job at um, Circle K and it was down the street and I worked at Circle K and KFC and they were right by each other and I remember I stayed with the manager which was Michelle and I stayed with her for about like six months and her two sons and I went through depression and I remember there would I couldn't stay still. I had to keep moving. That's you know, it would um I ended up losing my car and 
losing everything. It, it felt like I was losing my whole world, you know, and it seemed like everything I did, I did for me and Will, and I did to build us up. And, you know, when that was taken away, I just didn't feel like there was a need to do it anymore, you know. Um, so I stayed with Michelle and I was working at Circle K and I ended up getting fired from KFC because I just couldn't, I couldn't, you know, and at least at Circle K, you know, um, it really humbled me too. I was such like a mean person back then, you know, looking back and it like just angry at the world and angry at everybody because I was just so judged and everything to where it really just humbled me up, you know, and I worked at Circle K and I lived with the manager at Circle K and, you know, we would take turns doing shifts and we would work the same shifts. And um, I just remember that was the time that like um, Rihanna came out with that song Diamonds, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I would play it over and over and I would, she stayed in these apartment townhouses that were about 20 or 20 minutes from like the main town to where I was used to live in. And I remember I would walk at like midnight or 11 o'clock, you know, I didn't have rules and I would just walk for hours and go back to the mainland. And that's what I call it at the mainland, but um, walk around and just reminisce, you know, and it was hard. And I remember, like, back then I was wearing, you know, tight jeans like I always wore and with, like, holes in them and leopard print jeans and, you know, being flamboyant as hell. And I just remember, like, people were trying to always, like, pick me up thinking I was a prostitute or, you know, things like that. And um, I just kind of, like, wished to myself, like, you know, we always hear, like, that wouldn't happen, you know, and. Going People through were, going through loss. Yeah. Significant loss. It I can my my heart goes out to you absolutely for that, you know, time period you're in. It, uh and I and I appreciate you you opening up and speaking a little bit about it. No, not very many people understand what it's like to go through this any of the stuff that you brought up and you've done it in extreme detail. Uh I felt like I'm I felt like I was in the same room as you as you went through these situations. And it, it can't be easy for you to get through that. So I appreciate you taking the time to do that and, and to set the stage so I can understand truly. Um, man, it must. You you have to be a really strong person to go through loss, significant loss like that, um, and still be here today. Be able to, to even talk about it is is a huge thing. But, yeah. but to talk about it openly with with a stranger, you you really got this thing dialed in. And I, I appreciate you, uh, you, you taking the time to get that across. And I, I don't think that it's ever easy to, to deal with loss and, and experiencing a loved one like that lost. Mm -hmm. you, you just, you just, you don't, you don't, it doesn't get fixed overnight or over a couple of years. Yeah. There were days. Um, I didn't find nobody attractive. Um, you know, used to, when I was with William, I, you know, like look at people at Walmart, like, Oh, he's kind of cute. Or, like that that time in my life, I didn't find nobody attractive. I felt like I was still cheating, you know, deceased. And I, I felt like I couldn't, you know, and everybody always knew who we were. There. And a lot of people tried me when he left, tried me um different types of ways as it would be sexual or, or try me as in like fighting, you know, tried as in, you know, oh, you don't have your bodyguard no more. Like, what's up? And I was so hurt that I couldn't even fight if I wanted to. You know, um, that's cruel. I kind of, you know, and you know, people would say like hateful things, like you know, oh, that happens to all gay people. Y'all all die. You know, that's what y'all deserve and stuff like that. And terrible shit. It it really just made me very upset because I was just going through so much and you know here I am I, 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 life was starting to be okay and now I'm I'm at war again with everybody and 
I just kept telling myself, you know, shine bright like a diamond, shine like a diamond, you know, diamond in the rough, you know, like the lyrics of Rihanna. And, um, you know, I was listening to Life Jennings a lot, you know, and Life Jennings was, you know, one of one of the people who helped me out of depression as well as um, Rihanna. And I think that's why they're so, like, you know, um, strong to me. You know, side note, I saw Life Jennings and say probably like three years ago and I bought his ticket and I, I, he came out and I cried. I cried the whole fucking concert. Um, and I'm sure everybody was looking at me like, what was going on? But they didn't understand that they the pain that I went through while I was listening to him and then to see him in person and to hear him talk and to hear him sing in real life was just such a blessing. It was one of the things I ever, I always wanted to do. So, you know, when he came out and he said like, A-O-U, I just started crying, you know, and cried the whole concert. So, because during all that I went through, I just, I, hearing his story, I guess like helped me a lot, you know, and um, being in Louisiana and, you know, dealing with all of that and cutting off all my friends and wanting to be, you know, secluded from the world, you know, I started doing drugs again, heavy. And I mean, there would, you know, looking back, I don't know how I survived, but there were days that, you know, I'd wake up in a ditch or, you know, to one of my homegirls finding me or I would wake up at somebody's house that I didn't know or, um, you know, I'd wake up thinking it's Monday and it's Wednesday or, you know, um, there were many days that, you know, like Michelle saved me, you know, and I could have been in some bad situations or there were many days that, you know, different friends found me in, you know, bad situations that could have really got worse. You know, um, there were days I didn't remember where I was or, you know, I would be outside in a bush or, <laughs> you know, um, certain things like that. And I was just going crazy, you know, and at that point, I haven't talked to my mom in two years. And I remember I was working at Circle K and um, there was a dude that came in and he worked at LSU Hospital, you know, where my mom used to work at the morgue because it said morgue on it. And I was like, oh, um, I was like, my mom used to work there. And he was like, oh, where? And I was like, oh, at the morgue. And he was like, oh, where at, at the morgue? And I was, what was her name? And I was like, oh, Felisa, you know, Robin Alt was her last name at the time. And he was like, oh, he was like, you're Felisa's son? And I was like, yeah, that's my mom. And he was like, you look just like her. And I was like, yeah. And I went to work the next day. And um, I guess this kind of like hit me too, you know. Um, the general manager ca uh, calls me to the back. And she, hey, you, you have a phone call at the front. Um, it's your mom. And I was like, um, well, I called a lot of people mom. You know, I had Mama Sheila and I had Mama Michelle and I had Mama mm -hmm. Stacy. You know, I didn't know which mom it was. So, you know, and Mama Miss A, I called her mama. You know, I didn't know what mama it was. And I answered it was my actual real mom. <laughs> and she was crying on the phone and um, she was saying like, um, I've been looking for you for two years. You know, um, I changed my number after she left and, you know, changed my Facebook and everything. And she was like, I've called every morgue and every funeral home and every hospital and every police department and every prison, you know, and we hired an investigator, you know, and where you're at, you know. And um, I think I cried when she said that because I finally felt like she missed me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I finally felt like at one, what I wanted when I moved out was what she was finally giving me. You know, I finally felt like I was wanted, you know, and I asked her how she found me. And she said that the other day, one of your customers came in that used to work with me. And he called me as soon as he heard it, that was you. And he knew I was looking for you. And I think I cried because that's why I say people come into your life at the perfect time because out of all circle K's to go through and out of all times of the day to go to a gas station and out of just, you know, just wearing your badge, you know, he could have took it off, you know, 
he, you know, I was able to make conversation with him and that's how my mom found me. And, um, you know, she asked me how I was doing and, you know, I was I'm so hurt, you know what I mean? But I didn't want to tell her that. So I just kind of, you know, I was told I was fine and everything or whatever. And, but I wasn't fine, you know, and yeah, you had just experienced a, a tremendous amount of loss. You're dealing with a feeling of, of abandonment. You're dealing with uh, social yeah. anxiety uh, from from identity identity issues from from not feeling loved and accepted for a long time. You're dealing with being treated poorly by by the person who was supposed to be the head of the household, your your father or the caretaker or the protector right. or whatever. He was judging you for who, how you dressed. You, you're not right. going to feel like home's home in those times. And, and I'm glad you were able to to see a sign of of you being sought after by your mother. Um, and as bad as I hate to say it, at that point in my life, I needed my mom. You know, I, I was dealing with so much at one time, you know, and she asked me I want to go home, but I couldn't go home until, you know, I finished unfinished business, but about a month went by, maybe a couple of weeks, and you know, to Will's thing, and you know, his mom came up to me, you know, and I think I learned at an early age you can't run from your problems, you know what I mean. Um, eventually they're gonna come back and haunt you, you know. And um, she came up to me and she was like, "Oh, how are you doing?" And you know, I was like, "Oh, I'm so, you know, I'm just so heartbroken." And she pretty much told me that um, in the wreck, you know, everything, a lot of things crashed, but his phone, you know, and she was able to get into his phone and she saw the text messages and the calls and what I had said, you know, to him. And she pretty much said, like, you know, if, if I knew you were going to be the death of my son, I would have never okay job to be together and she yeah, left me say me there standing and I was just so already getting to an okay point to where I didn't know what to say you know what I mean and I didn't know how to react and at that point I I called my mom and I was like, I'm ready to come home. <laughs> you know, I'm ready. I can't do it. You know what I mean? And my mom got me on the Greyhound and I was so heartbroken. And a lot of people, you know, blame me for that. And, you know, I even blame myself, you know. And I wanted to start over. You know, my mom's in Georgia. Nobody knows me. You know, um, my mom was, you know, in Atlanta. Nobody knows me, you know, and I can start over as somebody else, you know, and try to hide my problems and burn for my problems and leave them, you know, on, you know, in Louisiana and leave, you know, that because Miss A, you know, when I was going through drugs and I was going through different things, you know, Miss A told me, you know, never let your um, struggle be your identity, you know, and um, that was some real shit that I ever heard in my life because I was, my struggle was my identity. You know, I went from, you know, rebel this, you know, striving 17, 18 year old with a car, two jobs, you know, working, has an apartment. I mean, I was having things that people don't do until they're like 25, you know, and to drugs and depression you know what I mean and that was my identity you know used to you could speak my name and people be like oh I know him you know he got everything going for him and then you speak my name and they're like whoa like yeah he going through a lot like you know what I mean and um I was just ready to leave after that after that whole thing I was just ready to go we ended up talking later on in the future and we ended up like understanding each other's things and we ended up you know ma making making do with what it was you know me and his mom you know eventually later on in life you know we ended up hashing things out and we understand each other and you know we're cool um 
but at that time, I think she was so hurt and I was so hurt, you know, and, you know, I have to think about it as her aspect. Like she told me, you know, like I just lost my only son, my baby, my, you know, my world, you know, and she wasn't looking at it as, you know, like I just gave up my life for him. You know what I mean? It's what I felt, you know, I gave up, you know, everything, you know, like I worked two jobs for him. I, you know, tried you know, I didn't go to college for him. I, you know, different things. Like, I stopped talking to my own family for him, you know. So there was just different things that we didn't look at each other's aspects of things, you know. And I guess if that would happen to me as my only son, I think I would probably be pissed too, you know. Mm -hmm. But Do you think that in hindsight, you can look back and, and give yourself some grace and, and say, you know what? I I'm not responsible for whatever happened. That that's the one of the just the pains of life. Have you have you forgave yourself yet? I forgave myself later on, but it took a lot of time. Um, I believe that everybody has a purpose in life, you know, mm -hmm. and it's the purpose. And I feel like when you fulfill that purpose, you know, it's your time to go. And you know, I feel like it could be a a purpose of showing somebody love that's never experienced love or showing somebody remorse that has never experienced remorse or showing somebody a lesson that they needed to, you know, to achieve greater things. You know, I don't, I never wanted to believe that his life was for me. You know what I mean? And I think that's why I was so hurt. And I know it wasn't, you know what I mean? There was probably something that he, did. I mean, you know the effect where they say like you kill a butterfly and a butterfly if you go back to the past and you kill a butterfly and it could cause like a whole you know maybe you know he did something that I don't know about that changed life some way you know what I mean but I just felt I just felt so much greatness from him that I just felt like his life was like made to be like better you know what I mean and I often did you know judge myself and think that it was oh you know for you know years you know and I think that's why I just moved to Georgia to like run for my problems you know and um still go through depression but I went through the pressure with my oldest sister because my oldest sister was in Georgia which was one of the reasons why my mom moved to Georgia was to be closer to her grandchildren you know my mm -hmm. sister my oldest sister ended up settling down there because she was at HM2 and back then they had um a naval base in Georgia, uh, Forest Park, Georgia, and she worked there and then she ended up getting out or whatever and she just stayed in Georgia because she met somebody or whatever. So um, she, my mom stayed, moved there to be closer to her grandchildren and I ended up living in Georgia and I ended up getting my job back at KFC in Georgia. For some reason, I always went back to KFC. It was just so easy, you know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. easy money. So, yeah, your comfortability it, zone. If you you already know what to do, you all got to do is show up and do it. Yeah, and I ended up being a, you know, shift leader, a manager, and a, a assistant manager, and a general manager at, in Atlanta. You know, um, at KFC, being one of the youngest at nineteen, um, running a store that made three million a year, um, because I worked at a KFC Taco Bell. And I didn't start out as a KFC talk about. I started out as a KFC and started went to like different stores. And at that point, after about like three months of depression, I you know ended up getting a job. You know, my sister told me pretty much like you need to get a job. Like, mm -hmm. I know depression is a lot, but you know you need to like get back out there. You know, and I mean there were days. I mean I wouldn't come out the bed for weeks. You know, um, there really? were days. It's real. Three, I was so used to sleeping with some beside, you know, him. So one thing that I would do was I would buy a heater and I would put it beside me in the bed and it would just remind me that, you know, his presence was still there or whatever. Because, you know, when you go from sleeping beside somebody for so many years and then sleeping into like a bed, it's like fucking freezing. You know, it's, it's you know, it's it, it feels weird, you know. And yes, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to feel that. So I ended up doing that. And I mean, there were days that like 
I would order like five hot wings and could only eat two and like one French fry, you know. Um, there were days that, you know, I would just wake up screaming and crying and think it was all a dream. And there were days that I would ask God to just kill me. You know what I mean? Like just strike me down with lightning, you know. Um, there were days that I would ask God, why, why him? Why not me? Like I was the one doing the drugs. I was the one acting a fool. I was the one doing this. I was, you know, and I would just be like, you know, like you took, I would blame him, you know, you like, you took him away from me. Like, you know, you did all it's these survivor's things. guilt. Yeah. And I was just so upset. Well, I finally started working and, you know, all I had going for me at that time was see Taco Bell, you know, and I was putting all my effort into it. I was moving up in the ranks so quickly, so young to work general manager and I ran the number one KFC Taco Bell in in a metro area and the number three store because it was two KFCs on top of me but that was they were top of me because of not sales but drive through time and everything else you know what I mean but with sales and stuff like that I was the number one KFC Taco Bell and number three and this fucking manager this is when I decided to join the military um she said that I was lying about my inventory. How is my inventory always green? How is my inventory, you know, always... But it was because I didn't play games like they did. I didn't have people stealing. I didn't... You know, I was nice to my coworkers, you know, just like I am in the military, you know what I mean? Like, if they were hungry, you know, I gave them, like, 80% discount instead of, like, a 10% discount. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't care. You know, it's fucking tacos and chicken. Like, I think I care? No, because I knew what it was like to not have nothing. You know what I mean? And at the end of the night, I let them take home the food. I didn't care because I knew what it was like to be broke. Mm. But that's how they're not going to steal from you. They're going to steal from you if you tell them no. They're going to do it fucking way. Them asking is them telling you, honestly. Even mm. in the military. Me asking you for an off day is me telling you. I'm asking you, can I be off on Saturday? Because I'm going to get off Saturday no matter if I got to go SIQ or take motherfucking leave. I'm, get, I'm getting off. So yeah. <laughs> them asking you for two pieces of chicken is them telling you they're about to eat two pieces of chicken. So you got to find a way to cover it up. Rather you put it in waste, rather you charge them for it and they only pay a dollar, or rather I would buy it for them. Because at that point I had money and I knew what it was like to not have money. And sometimes I would buy them food. You know what I mean? Because I knew what it was like. Yeah, And I think that's what my whole life, you know, prior to that was teaching me, was to be humble and was to understand, you know, what, like, people things. And even though I was making this money now, I didn't have it back then, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I knew what it was like. So I would, it, it definitely, you know, help my process, employees. And you know, gaining perspective is essential. Yeah. You know, when you go through these experiences that are tough, that are painful, that make you want make god make you think that god should strike you down with lightning all these things when you when you can persevere through them when you can take something from it can turn into something great in the future and you can give that knowledge that tool to somebody else so they can get through their issues as well so i think i was 19 about to be 20 at this time and i was hanging out with this girl in the neighborhood my mom hated her but my sister didn't really care for her either, but I liked her. Her name was uh, Timber. And um, I saw her one day walking her dogs and she dressed like me, you know, hose in the pants, like really scampy and like really fucking trampy. You know, I fucking dress. So, um, you know, wearing like hose tight jeans with Jordans, you know, pink shirt, like some scampy ghetto shit I was wearing, you know what I mean? So I was like, I really like her, you know what I mean? And like I said, people come into your life at the perfect time. And she came into my life at the perfect time because she was also going through the same thing, you know. And it was crazy because I met her while she was walking her dogs, you know, in the neighborhood. And I was just so happy to be outside smoking a cigarette. Um, and it was just like, hey, how are you? Da, 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 you know, trying to just, I don't know, I guess make a friendship. You know, I was so not new to it, but I was just so like not ready for it either you know I didn't know how to do it you know I didn't know if I came on to somebody too strong or you know like please be my friend but you know 
you know, I want to be heard too, you know, and she was going through similar thing, not that, but she was going through a breakup rather than, you know, a this a deceased breakup, but she was going through like a breakup that she gave her all and stuff like that. And it was crazy because I was living with my sister. She was living with her sister. They were 12, year older, 12 years older. I was 12 years older, you know, and um, we just really bonded. And I think that really helped us to where, you know, she would invite me, she invited me to a bar and I really didn't want to go, but I was like, you know what, I'll go. You know, like I said, in the South, it's 18 to enter, 21 to drink, but, you know, we would go to the bar and talk to people and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed that, you know, that camaraderie, I guess you could say, with different people and really getting back my foot into talking to people again and not being just such an introvert, you know, depressed person. And I think KFC's Taco Bell also helped me with that seeing the young kids come up in there and, you know, they're like 16, 17, they could only work three or four hours a day, you know, seeing them up in there and seeing other workers and really being able to get back to my social skills. Was able and to, just was able to get you to a point job where, doing it. sorry about that. Was they able to get you to a point where you can, can, can be social after a while? Yeah. Being in customer service. Yeah, it was starting to get me into like being social and started hanging out at this bar called Stockbridge Billiards, Billiards, um, which was like a little pool hall, or whatever. And you know, it was like where I learned how to play Jack, uh, Jack, what is it? Um, poker. I don't know what the fuck it was Black called. Jack. But Black Jack. Yeah, it was, I was. That's why I learned how to play poker. And learn how to shoot pool and stuff like that. Like, I already knew how to play spades and dominoes. But, you know, I didn't know how to do that stuff, you know. And um, I was, you know, interacting with people. And it was a place where I felt comfortable. I felt chill. You know, they knew I was gay and they didn't care, you know. And they, you know, I was finally also detoxing. You know, I haven't been doing drugs. You know, um, I was finally going through hell too. I feel like that was the reason why I was also sleeping a lot because I wasn't doing drugs. And I wasn't drinking anymore. Um, and it's funny, I would go to the bar, you know, not drinking, but you had to be 21 to buy it. So I wasn't drinking, I wasn't doing drugs or anything like that. And I was actually just being humble and just being thankful, you know. And uh, ended up, that's where I met, like, this girl, and she was going through everything as well, like I was going through, you know. She lost her kids, you know, to her, hus her, her husband, her ex-husband, because they broke up, and they didn't seem fit for her, or them to live with her. And um, she was going through, you know, she was on drugs, and she was trying to get off, and I really felt like a real bond for her, and we became like really good friends, you know, and she was older than me. I mean, I'm like, I think 19, 20, and I think she was already like 38, 39, you know what I mean? But I could relate a lot to her, you know what I mean? And we helped each other, you know, we helped each other get back on track, um, not really, um, you know, condone to the and stuff like that and let's do better let's hang out instead of doing drugs let's go to the movies or instead of doing drugs let's go out to eat or instead of doing drugs let's you know like go to the casino or let's do this let's do that and we were like helping each other to where it got to the point that like people would give her drugs she would give them to me and I'd throw them away you know what I mean to where it was, it was really at that point to where we were we were just so in sync every time was a good time it was a laugh it was a great time it was perfect I think at that point I was like 20 and I was turning 21 and um, I was under investigation at KFC for lying about my numbers. Um, so I would never forget, it was like midnight and we, it, we do close out at midnight on Mondays um, where you have to count everything in the store and the district manager and the CEO was at my store and, and was like, oh, we'll take over the count today. You know, you don't have to worry about anything. And I was like, the count. I was like, are you sure? I was like, I can count my own stuff. Like, you have the fucking CEO here. I can count my own shit. Like, what is this about? You know, and they were like, oh, well, we want to uh, we want to count it. We always do, like, an audit. And I'm like, whatever, fuck it. Y'all taking time off my fucking hands. So y'all can go audit. I'm going to go home and go sleep. 
because I wasn't worried about my numbers, you know, and um, they were counting my store or whatever because, you know, this other general manager was mad because she was always number two to my store. And, you know, they count everything. And um, they called me at, like, two in the morning, which is usually the time to count would end. And they were like, um, well, we counted your store, and the only thing that you're missing is a bag of lettuce, I think 25 straws, four legs, and I think, like, two cups, and um, a pound of oil. the garbage where it's at? Because it's probably in there. I don't know. Like, what? <laughs> what? Well, that stuff is like nothing. I mean, cups and lids and straws is like cents. You know, it was like three cents, five cents. They equaled up in a pound of oil. I mean, it was probably in the fucking fryers. They just didn't weigh. Hmm. You know what I mean? But they're not going to weigh it. Like, you're supposed to, but they don't. So I was just like, and it equaled up to like $20. So they were missing $20 on my inventory. Which is wh- how much I'm usually missing every fucking week. So he was like, uh, your store looks really good and stuff like that. And that just kind of showed me at the end of the day that these people like really don't give a fuck about you. And, you know, when the CEO and the district manager comes and like counts your store and nothing's fucking missing, like it hasn't been. I mean, you're always going to be down $20. But when I was down exactly like $20 and like three cents, and I was still in the green because you're you're like at like fast food restaurants you're okay at least up to a hundred dollars. So when they did that, it really showed me that, like I was still number one, like you know what I mean. But the bitch had the audacity to call corporate and they come down count my store and then come to find out there's nothing missing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But what is already expected to be missing? I mean, three or four cups that probably fell on the ground. 10 lids somebody probably threw away three or four straws somebody took extra for their house you know what I mean so when it was stuff like that it was just so funny because I was like these people really don't give a fuck about you and I was looking for a new job and I was um talking to my homegirl you know and she was telling me you know you should do this you should do that and finally my sister was like well you should join you know the navy and I was like I don't know you know what I mean like I don't know but I was like you know what I'll I'll try it because I want to benefit. So I was like, you know, I'll try it or whatever. And we went to rec- this and my sister ended up going to boot camp with recruiter, you know, way back when. So that was kind of like a plus. And <clears throat> they were telling me, and I think, like I say, everything happens at the, at the right time. You know, um, the recruiter told me I couldn't get in because I had a GED. And he was like, I could still help you go through that. And if they open it, you know, um, you'll already be done with MEPS and everything like that. So I ended up going to MEPS, stuff like that. As soon as I got done with MEPS, I went back to my recruiting office literally the next day, and he was like, guess what? They opened it up for GED. I know MEPS for me was super tough because I had to sit there. Uh, they told me to drink as much water as you can because if you don't, if you're not able to pee when it's time to pee, they're gonna it's going to screw everything up. So there, there I was drinking a gallon of water. I held my pee probably like some ungodly number of hours, like six, five or six or seven hours. I was sitting there just chugging a gallon of water on the bus to MEPS. And then we're sitting there for hours. I mm-hmm. had to take the ASVAP before I pee. I'm sitting like, can I take my piss test? They're like, why you need to take a piss test? Is there a time on the, on how fast you, uh, you know, your, um, you know, your piss clean, uh, piss clean drug is going to work. And I'm like, what? Yeah. You told me to drink water and pee. Like I'm, I'm here to drink water and pee. Like, let's do this. And like, no, nah, you got to take the ASVAP first. So going through the ASVAP was horrible. I just clicked through the last half of it. Still got a 70, but, you know, is what it is, right? So when I did mine, we had to take the ASVAP first. And mm-hmm. I scored pretty good on it. And I remember the recruiter, t- you know, offering me these jobs. And he was like, I was like, well, I don't know what I want to do. And he was like, well, you could do this. And I was like, I don't know. I don't see me doing that. And he's like, well, you could do this. And I was like, I don't see me doing that either. And he was like, well, tell me, he was like, actually, tell me, what is your hobby? What is your, what do you want to do? Like, what are you good at? And I was like, honestly, the only thing I'm good at is cooking. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've only worked fast food my whole life. And he was like, well, they do have, like, you know, a CS job. And I was like, what is CS? And he was like, culinary specialist. And I was like, well, what is that? He was like, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, my recruiter told me, he was like, it's long hours. And I was like, well, shit, I work long hours now. I was salary." You know, I was working from 
7 a.m. till midnight. So, I mean, what's longer than that at that point? You know what I mean? So, um, it's KFC. They don't care. You know what I mean? They they don't they don't care about you. Like once your salary, you know, you're not hourly. Yeah, they they're working you to death. So, I was like, you know, I'll I'll do that. You know what I mean? He's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, I want to be a culinary specialist. I was like, I didn't know the Navy had cooks. And he was like, well, who do you think cook the food? Jesus. Like, I was like, honestly, I thought y'all ate MREs. Like, I don't fuck it out. Like, all you see is like what you see on TV. And it really opened my eyes. That, like, what you see on TV is, you know, 9, 9% lies. So, you know what I mean? I thought, I didn't know you had cooks out in the sea or whatever. And, you know, I went through the MET process and the MET process was, you know, a bunch of them just yelling at you and you better pass these tests. Y'all don't know what's coming for you. And I'm just like, whatever. But honestly, what I was scared about, and, you know, like, I think all LGBT people were scared about this was, you know, like the HIV test, you know what I mean? Because at that point in my life, I was not like sexually active, but I was doing other things that could have got, you know, where I could have got, you know, that type of sickness, you know, um, you know, you're drinking after people, you're, you know, getting really close. And, you know, when you do drugs, you, you know, you do certain things that, you know, can, you know, do certain things, you know? So, um, I was scared about that. And when it came back negative, I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm good now. Anything after this, easy is a piece of cake, you know what I mean? So, you know, they made us deck walk and do all this. And, you know, I was like, oh yeah, I'm good about that too. You know, because at the point, you know, I don't know. You have to think I was, you know, laid out in ditches in in people's houses that I didn't know. I don't know what they did. You know what I mean? I don't know what I did. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So you have to think about certain things like that too. You know, and coming into the military, I was worried about that. You know, the uncertainty. I told myself, you know, if I pass this, like, I would never be in that type of situation again, you know? And I ended up dead passing it. And I remember that was the only thing I was worried about. They were like, oh, all your tests came back good. And I was like, what about the HIV test? And they're like, yeah, you're negative. And I was like, ah, well, I'm joining the <laughs> military, you know? And I'm going to do it 100%, you know? And I really felt part of something, you know? I felt I felt good about it because people were motivating you, you know, we're going through it together and, you know, with the MET process and, you know, my recruiter was like my number one supporter, you know, he was always checking in on me and always making sure, of course, he's, you know, looking back, of course, he was checking in on me. He was trying to make his quota, but, you know, um, he was, you know, he was really excited for me and he, you know, I was really excited to do the thing and, you know, go through MET process and, I was just so ready to, to leave and do something different, you know, in life. It was something, I guess, bigger than what I've been doing. And I wanted to be, you know, acknowledged, I guess, you know, or acknowledged that I did, you know, like a good thing. You know what I mean? So Yeah, to have pur and to have purpose, to have a calling, a tribe. You know, these things that we that we miss often when we leave the military, you know, in the veteran community, having those things. It's something that a lot of people look their whole life for. Somewhere you belong. You know, Lincoln, it's not just a Lincoln Park song. It's something that a lot of people look for that. Uh, I remember growing up watching right. Disney saying, man, I really want to have somewhere I belong to. And I and I found it with my tribe in the, in the military. But the process of leading up to that can sometimes be very, very tedious. And a lot of a lot of uh, walls you walk into, a lot of ones you create for yourself and you still walk into them. But uh, right. It's how you it's how you experience it and and power through it that really is really important, right? Absolutely. Well, you know what? Um, I think this is a good I think this is a good stopping point for, for part one. I don't know about you. I think we covered a lot of great stuff and and um I really wanted to say before we wrap this one up, it's really important for me to speak on this. You just spoke about the most traumatic experience that I've ever, one of the most traumatic experiences, like the top two that I've ever heard of in my life. Yeah. You dealing with that at a young age, there's a lot of, especially without guidance, it's easy to, to see how somebody could give up on life and you didn't. And I, and I commend you for being strong. I commend you for being powerful. I commend you for being brave and talking about it. Um, 
hearing those words at a funeral for somebody that you cared about. Um, I, yeah. I can tell you personally, I would have I would have done one of two things, and I'm not gonna mention either one on this on this channel ever. But um, they, none of them would have been positive, and I'm I'm very very thankful that you're that you're still here to tell tell your story and to tell your journey, and I'm thankful that you can put it in a way that where I can I can benefit from uh, personally. I, I I don't know what it's like to be to be you, but you telling me that, that you. Um, we're put in a position where you feel like you had to quit being yourself, quit being, right. you had to pray for it to be different. That, that is all very, very real, raw, painful things. And I, um, you know, my heart definitely goes out to you for the, the tough, the tough upbringing you've experienced because no doubt it, it shows in your, in your character. Now your, your, your natural charismatic attitude that, you know, I'm fucking here and, yeah. and nothing's going to stop that. <laughs> I think, you know, I just been through, you know, so much that, you know, I don't care what people say at this point. I've heard it all. You know what I mean? And I think you get to that point to where you become numb, you know, like Lincoln Park said, you know what I mean? Like you just become so numb that, you know, no matter what people say, they're always going to talk. And it just, it comes to a point to where it doesn't even hurt anymore. You know, used to, you could call me, you know, faggot or this and I would feel it you know now you mm -hmm. call it to me and I just laugh because you know like I've heard so much that like that's the best you got you know that's like middle school to me you know what I mean like mm -hmm. I think it's different you know what I mean like make me feel it a different type of way and it just does it because you know when we get into part two you know it starts getting into like a, a lot of like family and death a lot of families saying it to you and when it's somebody that you really love and that you really care about saying it rather than just a random person in the street like you feel it different right? and then eventually it all, you know mm -hmm. so I think people were you know once we get into part two and up tomorrow I think people will understand you know why it just doesn't affect me the way that it you know that they think it does these days you know or they think that it, it would affect me because it doesn't you know it doesn't hurt yeah, you, know I mean? you develop mental mental hardness and and strength. So I, mm. and that's something I I can I can really mess with, man. And it, I I really do I really do enjoy your this this conversation so far, and I look forward to it tomorrow as well. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you you you're an active duty sailor. You you just got done with work and you came off and you started talking right. to me right right away. So thank you for thank you for your service first of all, and thank you for um taking the time to do this. I really do appreciate it. No problem. Absolutely. And thank you so much to every single person for listening. This has been another episode of Off the Deep End Podcast. As always, let's keep this conversation going on our Facebook page. There's no reason why anybody in this country should be made feel like they need to change to be accepted by society. I'm a big believer in that. And so that is what This Is Me, the series, is all about. Showing you what other people go through so you can have perspective. I definitely didn't grow up being as understanding or accepting of other people and their lifestyles. And and I'm I'm growing a level of understanding right now via the perspective my guests are giving me so thank you so much for tapping in let's keep this conversation have a, a lovely evening and stay tuned for part two